do a roll call. Sure. Good. All good, Brian. Yep. Okay. Mr. Williams. Present. Ms. Jordan Byron. Present. Ms. Wells. Here. Mr. Mushak. Here. Ms. Langalis. Here. Mr. Cantor. Here. Mr. Rowena. Here. Mr. Baxendale. Here. And Mr. Schulman. Here. Okay, all set. All right, uh, we have two open seats. So um, Ms. Jordan Byron and uh, Mr. Williams uh, will uh, both be seated um, for the items uh, under uh, review and action on uh, applications. And um, we'll, we'll see if we have other members uh, come and if we have to uh, change that. <clears throat> Under review and action on applications, um, the first item is 2022-20-8-24, referral City of Norwalk Board of Education, building management, acquisition of property in South Norwalk for Sono Neighborhood School. Uh, report and recommend action. I believe that uh, that's Mr. Lowe. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Alan Lowe on behalf of the city of Norwalk. Um, I think this is a long journey that the city has been uh, under for a number, a number of years. Uh, it's about South Norwalk and also the, um, the children of South Norwalk. There is no, right now there's no South Norwalk school. So all the children of South Norwalk get bus all over the city. Uh, with the change of a uh, uh, racial balance in the community. Uh, the state regulation allows the city to do something a little different. And we are able to actually build a South North school for the, for the kids in South North so they don't have to travel all over the city to, to go to school. Uh, this is a long effort, long time effort that the city has been working on for, and specifically for about five years. Uh, the city originally funded a new Columbus school as well as renovation of the existing Columbus school uh, but for a number of reasons and uh, we couldn't find a site that works. We were, look we were looking at uh, uh, Ely Park for a number of years, but then because it's a dedicated park land and there's a lot of restrictions associated with it, that project didn't come through. So for, uh, for the last four years or so, there's a number of discussions behind the scene about how we can, we can achieve our goals. And on uh, November of last year, the Board of Education approved a project to move Columbus School to the lower Pona School. Uh, and by doing that, we closed the two accounts, the, the, uh, the Columbus School account, as well as the uh, renovation of the Columbus School account. Uh, combined has a free balance of $76 million. And we came through the Planning, uh, planning and Zoning Commission as well as the city to allocate of the $76 million, we allocated $72 million for a new South Norwalk school. Um, <clears throat> we didn't transfer all the money over because we did estimate at that time, it's about $72 million. So we didn't ask for anything more than what we needed. Uh, but subsequent to that, uh, we went through this acquisition process on, um, uh, confidentially. We actually did a lot of work behind the scenes to negotiate the purchase of this property, uh, which is the uh, uh, one, Middle Street Extension. And through uh, six months of work behind the scene and working with a uh, property owner, which is Hatch and Bailey property, uh, we came to a very friendly acquisition of property. Um, and we uh, solidified those, those business deal, the acquisition deal. And we're here to, tonight to present it to, um, to the planning commission for approval on this section 8.24 of the Connecticut statute. So the, basically, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. There's two actions being proposed by the city. One is to transfer, uh, well, not transfer, allocate to a special appropriation, allocated additional $4 million of a free balance from the two accounts uh, to the new South North School project to, so that the combined, the revised total budget, uh, budget for that project would be $76 million, as well as approval of the um, purchase of the property. Um, well, let's, um, let's take uh, each one in uh, order. <clears throat> the first being approval for <clears throat> the purchase of the property. Uh, discussion regarding that item? Only basically to ask Alan if uh, fundamentally it meets the requirements of the 
state and the city in terms of the land area itself, because that's caused such a problem before. Alan? Uh, I, I wish there was a question there. Um, yes, um, the, yes total property, was. Uh, the total property is 11 plus acres. Uh, the state has a Department of Administrative Services that came down to look at the property. It's suited for, for a school. And we also did phase one environmental as well as phase two environmental. And uh, to the environmental consultant who did the testing and all, uh, we did sampling as well as test, uh, uh, test wells. And uh, the property for industrial property go is extremely clean. Uh, the only thing they find is some elevated level of metal slightly over, over the regulator level, but it's, it's uh, within, uh, we, the environmental consultant believe that's just a um, natural occurring and there's no remediation or removal of material offsite required. So um, everything is meeting all our requirements in terms of uh, building and constructing a school. Can I ask a second question? Please um, go ahead, Brian. Alan, what's about the transport? Um, traffic there is an uh, interesting little intersection. Yes, we, uh, we haven't, again, uh, we, 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 are quite, we are going to acquire the property. We recognize that it is a funding intersection. Uh, we allocate some money for uh, two things. Within a budget, we allocate about $700,000 for intersection improvement if necessary, maybe a traffic light, but we, the, the, those issues hasn't been addressed yet. Uh, separately, we have uh, the city allocated $1.5 million for safe, safe path to school, recognizing some of the streets are narrow and conditions are not, not the highest conditions. Uh, we don't know how much is it, how extensive it is in terms of how much what we need to do, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a long process for us moving ahead. I mean, there's going to be a lot of challenges. Uh, we recognize some of them, but we know the detail until we actually get into it. Um, you know, it's the focus to acquire a piece of property, 11 acres in South Norwalk, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, uh, you know, it's very difficult. I don't think there's too many pieces in town at all. Um, and also it's uh, under one ownership. So it's not like we have to acquire like 10 pieces of property, multifamily homes, and then we got to relocate all these family and all. So it is, uh, what's what the perfect site? I'm not sure there is one, but at the same time, as close as we can get, this is it. And also Hedge and Bailey, it's a, it's a willing seller and, and we negotiate it to the, to the business term to make it work. So there are challenges ahead. And again, we are looking at, um, we, we, again, separately, our, beyond the $76 million, we have another 1.5 allocated for sidewalk and access improvement. And also um, one other thing I wanna note is that recently the state approved the city's re increased reimbursable rates. Typ typically, previously, the city reimbursable rate is 33%. And we knew construction is, we lose 10%, becomes 22%, 23%. But with this, with a special act, uh, the city is going to get 60% reimbursement for this project, so which is substantial. It's, it was worth probably $20 million worth of savings to the city. So again, don't quote me on it. It's between 20 and 25, somewhere around that area. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Alan? Yes. Uh, Tammy, I'm, I'm go ahead. Question. Start with Tammy and then um, JJ. JJ. Okay, thank you, Lou. Um, good evening, Alan. Um, what uh, becomes of the projects that were going to be done at the Columbus School and the other school? <clears throat> those needs don't disappear now, do they? Um, we have, at this point, we have not decided what to do with the existing Columbus School at this point. Is that what you're asking? I'm not sure the question is. So Yes, because the, if those projects were on the books and now they've just sort of been right. canceled, the need sure. still exists, does it not? Um, yes, what happened is this, we, when we build the uh, new lower school at Pona School, um, it's, we've been using it for as, a, 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 as a swing space for, you know, so Jefferson School is in there now. And after, as soon as we finish Jefferson, uh, and, and actually by, by end of this month, um, we start bringing, uh, we are getting furniture delivery in July and the Jefferson School will move back from Pona's into the renovated Jefferson School. The proposal is move Columbus School, which is a magnet school, into the new uh, <clears throat> lower Pona School. So, so those needs, uh, the, the need for existing Columbus School to get a new school is satisfied by move them, moving them to Pona's. Uh, the existing Columbus School would be empty 
uh, by creating this new school, a South North school. Uh, so that prop, that building and property have currently the city do not have any plans for it yet. Uh, I think overall, I think the city as a whole, as a district, uh, it will, will have sufficient space for all the students. So I don't believe we need to uh, renovate, renovate that building for another school in the future. So again, the future is unknown to, to the building and what we do with the property yet. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, JJ. Hey, um, thank you for your presentation, Alan. Um, I have two questions in regards to the school safety zone um, for the new school. So that area right now, there's a lot of industry. I know that it's going to take a while, um, you know, before the school is fully erected and furnished and ready and the, and the kids can move in. But I'd like to know what is the city plan between that time for making sure that there's infrastructure in place for pedestrians, bikers, um, who will be utilizing the sidewalks, getting to and from school, also issuing a school safety zone with enough crosswalks and traffic lights. Uh, so this way it could slow down, um, you know, the, the mo motorists who are driving in that area. I mean, right now um, there has been reports of, you know, heavy, heavy trucks, as well as motorists who are driving too fast. Um, we definitely want to implement a school safety zone. So this way yep, it is known Monday through Friday that um, the hours of 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., you know, these laws will be implemented and enforced. The project, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the project would take about a year and a half for design. Uh, construction will probably take another year and a half. So altogether, it's probably three years from now. Um, the money that I mentioned before about the $1.5 million, <clears throat> excuse me, is being requested and allocated to the uh, trans Division of Transportation and Mobility. So <clears throat> I gotta get some water. And, uh, and so uh, we are, as soon as we get the state approval, we are submitting a grant application to the state by end of this month. And as soon as we get done, the process begins in terms of design and analyzing how extensive, how far, and some of these conditions. Uh, so we were behind traffic consultants and, 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 and uh, we're working with the transportation division to figure out um, the travel distances, the path, and all that in the future. So it's not, I don't have a clear answer for you at this point. Uh, it is part of the, the evolution of design and management of these, these is, is safety issues and concerns. So. Uh, I think the city, it's, um, it's, I think the Board of Education and the Common Council, uh, in fact, I think I, I saw some email, I think it was just, just this morning about uh, what, doing walking tour at the, the community and it's not really getting into a little bit more. Not that we, I mean, again, it's, it's just, um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a long journey ahead of us still, so. Okay, and so thank you for answering that. I mean, like you said, right now, there's a lot of moving parts but um, this is something that the board is aware of that the community wants, correct? Yes. Okay, so then my second question, so the first question was about pedestrian safety in a school safety zone. And so then my second question is regarding um, just in terms of green space and trees, will there be a commitment towards green space and, and a tree canopy that can provide a, um, a park-like setting or a pleasant walking experience for those students instead of dealing with concrete, you know, and, and, and open yards and um, businesses and trucks coming to and from. Uh, we want to make sure that there is a, a pleasant um, um, walking environment for these young students who are making their way from their homes walking to the school. And there's not like like the tree canopy would provide um, protection um, against um, you know the smoke and the smog and the environment that um, these trucks and cars are making to and from. Um, be very very open and straightforward about the, answering your question. It's beyond my ability to answer those questions because these not, that your question is not site specific to this property. Um, but I, 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 I'm aware, I'm fully aware that the Common Council has been very active in terms of planting trees uh, in, the, in the entire city. Uh, I, think, I think we're talking to uh, uh, Councilman Livingston, the president of Common Council, 
uh, a number of different projects. Uh, the council is very active about um, uh, green paths and 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 you know. So again, I cannot I don't I don't I don't have the ability to answer your question specifically, but there is no plan specifically to how to you know to landscaping or, or, or green the South North community. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying. There's right right now. There's no artist rendering that includes that. But I guess what I'm requesting as is that that becomes part of the plan, that that's not left on the table. That, you know, this is very important to have greenery, you know, you know, within the scope of this school. Within the property, it's, 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 it's right. that I, I have the ability to manage and control and develop. Uh, one of the reasons why we look at this property is, is that, you know, I think, I'm not sure you heard this before. There was a boy that has an idea of uh, using the existing Columbus school property to build a bigger school. And that will like, if, if we add another building to the existing existing Columbus school site, there's no land left. That's one of the right. criticisms. They were doing, they were using a, a rooftop playground and things like right. that. And, underground and, plus, and plus you were encroaching upon the properties the right next to it. Yeah, so I, yeah. knew, I knew that wasn't a good idea. Yeah, so it was, yeah. Uh, that didn't work out. I mean, again, there was a lot of negative, but I, I don't I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm not criticized. Don't get me wrong, I'm not criticized for it. It's just the idea came up and then we talked about it and, and then uh, there's plenty of uh, cons that go with the uh, that concept and that was, that was dismissed very quickly. Uh, Alan, that's what... Alan, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting, but uh, I think I can answer JJ's question. Okay. Um, we get a couple more bites at this apple. Uh, okay. The Board of Education has to come before us with the plans. Um, and typically there's a review as there is tonight, for example, with Wegmans um, of uh, what their preliminary plans are. Uh, I would expect the Board of Education, probably with Alan making the presentation, will be doing the same thing. Uh, and then we will have to schedule a public hearing on this as well. So we will have a couple of opportunities to uh, ask them to address those questions. However, you're having brought it up uh, makes it pretty pretty clear, I think, to the city that this is uh, something that the commission's uh, interested in and concerned about. Thank you very much for um, that clarity. Thank you very much, Alan, for um, taking my question and also doing your, when you go back to the Board of Ed, this will definitely be on the list. Are there uh, any other questions? Michael, go ahead. Uh, well, well, Tammy, you were next, right? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to say I second JJ's uh, comments. I support them as a resident of uh, the neighborhood, more or less, you know, a mile away, but uh, still in South Norwalk. Uh, that is uh, extremely important. It's been very important to us for the 20 years I've been here. So yes. Uh, thank you, JJ, for bringing that up. You're welcome. Uh, anything else before we vote on this matter? All right. If not, uh, what we're being asked to do is uh, to uh, approve uh, the uh, sale of uh, the property by the uh, city of Norwalk. I'm sorry, uh, the purchase. Next, pardon me? The purchase of the property, not sell. I, I thank you for correcting me. Uh, can I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay, uh, JJ moves. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, we have a second from uh, Mr. Baxendale. Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, I, have, what was I, have, I have one comment, sorry. Go no. ahead. Uh, I would just ask the city to please do the best they can to help relocate the Corville Services Nursery, which is on the property. Uh, they are uh, an integral part of the economy of, of Norwalk uh, and the region. Uh, I know this because I uh, use them and there are hundreds of small contractors who rely on that business. It's not a normal small company. It's a, a company that's providing uh, plants and materials to contractors everywhere it's a big loss uh for the for 
the community, for the business community. And so I would hope that there is uh, some discussion in terms of helping them relocate uh, in Norwalk uh, uh, because uh, you know they've been here a long time and uh, they're renting, so they don't really have much say in the sale of the property. But uh, um, Hatch and Bailey, I don't know much about their business. I uh, drive through it on the way up to the nursery up on the hill. Um, it's a stunning piece of property. It has views uh, across the sound in three directions and up Wilson Cove. Really amazing piece of property. Uh, I, I've always, when I've driven up there, I've always thought, wow, this is a <laughs> this would be a great place. I never thought to build a school, but to build something. But anyway, uh, that that's all. I'll, I'll just want that comment on the record that okay. I'm hoping hoping that that business can be um, assisted in some way. Uh, Lou, Lou, I'd no. like to second Mike's comment too because it was on my mind, but I didn't want to ask Alan if it was part of the purchase or excluded. But I do. I also think it's. Um, you know, it would be nice if the city could help them because there are a lot of people that work there too. And all of those people are now going to be put out of a job if they can't find a new place, not to mention all the employees at Hatch and Bailey, which is their decision. That's a business decision they make. But anyway, thank you, Mike, for bringing that up. Okay. Sure. Uh, Steve, let's do a roll call on this. Sure. I mean, everybody can see the resolution that's up. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I believe that Mr. Williams and Miss Jordan Byron were seated for this. Correct? Okay, I'll start. Uh, uh, Mr. Williams? Yes. Miss Wells? Yes. Miss Jordan Byron? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes. Miss Langalis? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. Mr. Baxendale? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Yes. I believe that's unanimous. Okay. <clears throat> now let's, uh, now, now that we've, uh, <coughs> excuse me, authorized the city to go ahead and purchase uh, the property, uh, we need to uh, vote to approve the um, additional money they need for the project. Um, and um, this is a special appropriation request for the South Norwalk Neighborhood School. Um, is there, uh, are there any questions about this or any comments on this? This is the four million, is it? Alan, is this the four million with? with yeah, it's four million dollars. Okay. <clears throat> we had previously approved uh, the balance. Uh, if the, uh, I'm sorry, Galen. I'll move to approve. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Uh, okay. Uh, Richard and Darius both both moved. And here is the motion. Okay. Any. Um, Discussion uh, about the um, resolution? If not, um, why don't we go right to a vote? Um, again, Steve, uh, roll call, please. Sure, Mr. Williams? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Ms. Jordan Byron? Yes. Mr. Mushak? Yes. Ms. Langallis? Yes. Mr. Cantor? Yes. Mr. Rowena? Yes. Mr. Baxendale? Yes. And Mr. Shulman? Yes. Also unanimous. All right. Uh, I'd like to uh, note uh, that um, uh, Mr. Patches, uh, Commissioner Patches, uh, has uh, uh, joined the meeting. He had indicated earlier that he was going to be a few minutes late. Um, I think, Darius, for this next item, um, I'm going to unseat you and uh, seat Mr. Patches so that he can vote on this matter. And then we have one other matter. And uh, for that matter, uh, JJ will 
um, not be voting. Um, so with that, 2022-19 um, R slash SP slash SPR, Weg Wegmans Food Markets, Inc., 47 Richards Avenue and 677, 667 and 651 Connecticut Avenue. Z there are two items, zoning text amendment and special permit and site plan review application for a Wegmans grocery store, parking structure, and two additional retail buildings. And this is a preliminary review uh, uh, after which um, uh, we, we can uh, decide whether to uh, move this to uh, uh, public hearing. And I believe Attorney Hennessy uh, is uh, leading the charge here. Yes, sir. Can you hear me all? Yes, we can. Well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, with your permission, I'll, I'll begin our brief presentation. Uh, and, and I'd like to uh, begin by uh, just noting that this is the first time I've had the uh, privilege of, of speaking to you since you've been uh, reconstituted, as it were, several months ago. So uh, this is uh, indeed good. For those uh, few of you who I haven't uh, had the privilege of meeting, my name is William Hennessy. I'm an attorney with the firm Carmody Torrance Sandak and Hennessy. Uh, and uh, I'm here in connection with the uh, applications uh, the chairman referenced, which if approved, will result in the opening of Connecticut's first uh, Wegmans food market right here in Norwalk at 47 Richards Avenue. Uh, with me are several folks from the uh, development team that I think it would be uh, efficient for me to introduce to you right now. Uh, Tim Ondarko from Langen Engineering, uh, who's led the uh, design uh, effort here, uh, a complicated one at that, as you'll understand, uh, is uh, on the screen. Uh, I believe somewhere in this constellation of people is his uh, colleague, John Plant, who has led the equally complicated uh, effort to make uh, the parking and traffic operations at this uh, uh, facility uh, work as smoothly as they will work. Uh, my colleague, Jason Klein, uh, is here, who's done all the, the hard work, frankly, uh, on the legal end of this. And from Wegmans, a, a, a gentleman that you see uh, on your screen, Steve Lady. Steve is a project manager he, uh, for uh, Wegmans. He's opened uh, stores before, designed them. He understands the, the challenges uh, and the opportunities of doing this. And he's also uh, uh, very familiar with Wegmans. Uh, as, a, as an institution and as a, a business. We've been advised by your staff that you have a very, very busy uh, uh, agenda. We've been asked to be very crisp and succinct, and we will endeavor to do that, I promise you. Uh, and what we'd like to do is accomplish three things. Number one, uh, we'd like to explain to you a little bit about Wegmans. Uh, some of it is germane to the zoning. Some of it, frankly, is not, but it will contextualize a lot of what you're gonna to hear tonight and let you understand why uh, things should be done in way, ways that we propose to do them. The other thing I'd like to do, the second thing is explain to you uh, basically the application, the, the site plan uh, portions of it and the text changes, which we think are, are rather simple and uh, additive to the zoning regulations uh, in general. Uh, and uh, uh, while I will uh, do that, uh, if you have any questions, we're all here to, to address them. And then the last thing is, of course, to, to answer any questions that you may have as a result of uh, uh, our brief presentation. Uh, I think in a moment, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Mr. Leedy, who will tell you about Wegmans. But it occurs to me that since we've been you know, talking to people and groups for, I don't know, close to a year now about the project, and we tell everybody it's a 47 Richards Avenue, and that's the MBI site, uh, and MBI is relocating uh, uh, in any event, and this is the opportunity for Wegmans to uh, locate a site uh, which is uh, appropriate and, size, and, and, and sized for its use. Uh, uh, it occurs to me that, and it has surprised me a bit, that, that many folks in town don't exactly know exactly where or how to get to MBI. It's kind of a it's a different kind of property. It's incredibly centrally located. Uh, you tend to see it best from I-95, especially during the winter months. Uh, but I thought I would just help you understand where it is and the opportunities that have been 
uh, created here by uh, Wegman, <coughs> frankly, taking its time uh, by assembling the site. The largest piece you see there, uh, where Jason's uh, running the, uh, the, the cursor, is the nine acre MBI site. It's uh, improved with a one story uh, building that's used principally for office, but for all their activities really uh, under one roof. It's about 110,000 square feet uh, in size. And uh, what's not uh, uh, covered with building, most of it is, you can see is covered with a uh, surface asphalt uh, parking lot. The uh, uh, access, the principal access is off of Keeler in and out. Uh, the Keeler access is set back a bit with, uh, you know, what we call uh, the, the landscaping uh, in, in front. Uh, there's a, you know, a gate to prevent you from just sliding in if the facility is closed, but it's very well maintained uh, facility uh, and a very private facility. Uh, th there's a couple of features about this that are going to become important when we talk about the site plan. I'll just point one out now. Uh, that is the grade difference. The, uh, the buildings uh, to the north of it, the Raymore and Flanagan's, the uh, uh, Lumber Liquidator Building, the Mr. Shower Door, uh, the Urgent Care Center are all located about, I think Tim can correct me if I'm wrong, but about 16 feet higher than the surface parking lot of the, uh, of the MBI site. Uh, that presents an opportunity for us we'll discuss a little later. The other uh, feature about the site that's important is the uh, in the lower left, you'll see some blue lines. That is an easement that allows access uh, to and from Richards Avenue from uh, uh, through the, uh, uh, Mer uh, the, the American Cancer Society, uh, Society site. Uh, and then another uh, feature is something that's not uh, visible on this, but there is actually a vestige uh, remnant uh, uh, of the I-95 drainage patterns, which over the years has created a technical wetland, uh, barely touching our property, mostly offsite. That forced us to uh, go to the uh, Wetlands Commission and obtain uh, uh, approval to uh, conduct uh, regulated activities. That has been obtained. We had that approval. It's, uh, it, it conforms to the site plan, you see. Uh, so those are the, uh, that, that is the MBI site. During the course of this, and we'll explain this a little later uh, in more detail, but during the course of the site planning for this site, it became apparent that while traffic worked here and operated sufficiently, it didn't operate to the levels that uh, Wegmans expected it and wanted it to operate. Uh, and uh, therefore Wegmans took its time with this application and went through the process of negotiating the, uh, uh, the involvement, frankly, to purchase of three other sites. Uh, and those are the ones you see to the north of the MBI building. Uh, one of those is the uh, uh, 677 uh, Connecticut Avenue. That's the urgent care site. Uh, the other is the Wells Fargo site, which is uh, 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 667 Connecticut Avenue. And the last is 651. That's a Mr. Shower Door Lumber Liquidators. Those, uh, the acquisition of those allows for the uh, ingress and egress patterns to be greatly enhanced and the internal circulation also to be greatly enhanced. And we'll discuss that as we go through the uh, site plan in just a few minutes. I offer this to you now so you understand two things. Number one, where the site is and how it operates and what roads and streets it touches. And number two, so that you understand and appreciate the level of commitment that an operator and an owner like Wegmans has for its, uh, for its customers and also for its neighbors and the community it's in. We'll get to all that a little later. But Steve, maybe this is a good time for you to explain a little more about the, the Wegmans philosophy and what it means to be a part of a Wegmans community. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for the great introduction and good evening, Mr. Chairman, other board members. It's a pleasure to finally be in front of you. We've I'm working on this site diligently for quite a while, and as, as Bill eloquently spoke about acquiring different pieces of real estate and trying to put this project in its best light before it ever came in front of the board. So our goal is to make this work for 
the city of Norwalk and also Wegmans customers. So we have a great team of professionals that can speak to all of that. Uh, everybody's been wonderful to work with. What I wanted to speak about was a little bit about Wegmans. So the first thing is who's been to a Wegmans? Yeah, I got a couple of hands. So you guys kind of know what you're in for. Um, it, there you go. <laughs> I, I love Wegmans. <laughs> Great. Love to hear it. So I have a quick little presentation here. Just done a little bit of history. Some of you may know some of this stuff if you've heard of Wegmans, but our founders were brothers, Walter and John Wegman. Uh, they had a pedal to fresh produce from a push cart in 1916 and we opened as the rochester fruit and vegetable company and to this day <clears throat> our signature items are our fruits and vegetables as you walk in the front of the store that's what you're going to see that marked the beginning of wegman's food markets so robert wegman assumed leadership of the company in 1950 and he passed away in 2006. So today we're headquartered in Rochester, New York, a family owned and totally privately held business. Danny, which is Robert's son is the chairman to this day. And his daughter, Colleen is the CEO and president. And his daughter, Nicole is president of the Wegmans brand. We operate 107 stores as of right now in seven states. We have a store ready to open in Washington, DC very exciting project that's going to open in July. Uh, you may be hearing about that. We have another store at the end of the summer that's going to be opening in Delaware. So that's an exciting project for us as well as we enter into a new state, as well as Connecticut, which we're excited about. We employ more than 53,000 people, annual sales in excess of $11 billion. We are a leader in the grocery store industry. We have a number of accolades. But one that we're especially proud of is, we're, is our ranking in the annual Fortune Magazine's list of 100 best companies to work for this year. We're number three. We've been as high as number one. And we've been ranked on the list as long as the list exists. So we're very proud of that. Ranked number one on people's 2021 companies that care list, which is another exciting accolade for the company. So we get thousands of letters from people every year that they want us to come to their hometown. Maybe they moved out of state and they have a new location and they want a Wegmans. They want to bring Wegmans to where they are. We get hundreds of letters from Connecticut every year of folks that want us to locate in Connecticut. And we're really excited to have this opportunity on this piece of property in the city of Norwalk. Jobs. I'll just briefly touch on some of the things that we can bring to a community. Not your average retail jobs. We hire four to 500 employees with each new store, which is always a challenge. We have 180 and up to 200 full-time job, uh, 250 plus part-time jobs, which is your high school kids, your college kids, folks that don't wanna work full-time anymore. They wanna work part-time and help us provide that great customer service that our customers expect. There's great advancement opportunities to all of these employees if that's what they choose to do. There's high level, uh, all the way from store managers, area managers, sous chefs, department managers, HR, tons of career oriented opportunities within Wegmans. Our commitment to the community, we are, very invested in every single community that we're involved in. Uh, we are guided by four giving priorities, but we invest in every community we serve. And you will soon learn that in Norwalk, how our store gets invested in everything that's going on around them. Four priorities, feeding the hungry, very important. One of our highest giving priorities, youth and family, as a family company, we're dedicated to helping families grow healthy and strong. Education, including our Wegmans Employee Scholarship Program, which is an unbelievable program helping folks 
get higher education and enriching neighborhoods from supporting local United Ways to town celebrations. And I could go on and on about our commitment and enriching neighborhoods. And again, this is getting into the annual giving categorized here into hunger relief, customer giving, education, United Way, community-wide donations. Last year, $72 million were given to, to our communities. And there's some other uh, fun facts on the bottom of the slide. I did wanna to touch on our sustainability efforts. It is absolutely one of our top priorities at Wegmans right now, and we're a leader in the industry. We have a, we have a mission. We believe it is our responsibility to help create a healthier, better planet by growing organically near our stores, eliminating waste, and reducing our carbon footprint. And the vision, which includes sourcing near our stores, eliminating waste, reducing plastic packaging, which you know in our industry is a tough one and we are on it, and reducing our carbon footprint. I did want to bring one of the things that kind of leads into the sustainability topic, and that's our organic farm. And just a quick little slide with this beautiful picture on Canandaigua Lake and the Finger Lakes. This is where our Wegmans organic farm and orchard is. is, is. We operate with a mission to sustainably source more organic produce and extend the East Coast growing season. And all of the learnings that we get from this farm, and this is a large farm and it's really taken off. I've personally been there and done some work there, is to educate our local growing partners around the store. So for here, it would be in the city of Norwalk so that they can extend their growing season so that we can continue to buy the majority of our produce from local growers. That's a big priority for us. The farm, the Wegmans Farm is committed to achieving 95% zero waste this year. Some of our sustainability goals and celebrations from this year, there's a lot of information on this slide, but just touching on eliminating waste, sustainable packaging again, and our carbon footprint. Uh, we want to increase our company recycle rate from an already high 76% to 85% by the end of this year. The packaging eliminates 6 million pounds of plastic in 2022 through various initiatives that we have. In our carbon footprint, we're committed to an annual reduction of 1.25 million gallons of diesel fuel this year. So, one of the ways that we're gonna be doing that, and this is very exciting, and if you're into trucks and engines and all that stuff, we're converting 16 of our big trucks, our tractor trailers, into compressed, natu um, compressed natural gas trucks. So we, I've seen some of that out at our facility, and it's very impressive. We have a zero waste initiative at Wegmans. And one other thing of note is, Company-wide, by the end of 2022, we are going to eliminate all plastic bags from the rest of our stores, which is a significant thing. I'm not sure if all, if all of you folks have adjusted to that yet, but once you do, it really works great. So I just have a few photos here of what to expect on the inside of a Wegmans. A focus on fresh, fresh produce, as I said in the beginning, we started as a fruit and vegetable company. We continue to focus on that. When you walk in the front of the store, the first thing you're gonna see is a wonderful full color display of all fresh produce, fruits and vegetables. An incredible customer service, which is a staple of Wegmans. Restaurant quality prepared foods. Here I have pizza and sushi. Well, we have all of the prepared foods, the bakery with the European breads, donuts, and other desserts, <laughs> favorite of everybody's. Cheese the Mediterranean shop with artisan cheeses, 
We have our own uh, Wegmans cheese case in Rochester, New York. Prepackaged Mediterranean options with the olives and the mozzarella, mushrooms, all the good stuff. Seafood delivered daily from the East Coast, and we import food from uh, seafood from around the world. Deli and charcuterie, deli meats and cheeses, specialty meats, dried sausages, and all kinds of good stuff. Meat, and we have a butcher shop, of course. And in addition, in addition to the conventional meat, we have a complete um, organic beef uh, display. And one of my favorites is the family pack savings. Family pack items save time and money compared to regular size packages. So you buy a larger portion of it and you get a lower price. And it really is a great value. And you'll see that throughout the store. So that's my end of the introduction in this preliminary phase to, uh, to the board. Uh, this is a, a nice slide showing a really active store uh, we've created an outdoor seating area. We have much more of this type to, of illustrations to show you, but I just wanted to tee off um, the other professionals as they get into the actual site part of it. So any questions, or I can just pass it back to Bill or Tim. Thank you. Well, hearing none, Mr. Chairman, I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll turn now to the site plan, but uh, I will say that uh, uh, looking at the images that Steve just showed reminded me that I haven't had dinner. So I will <laughs> probably uh, speak a little fast. <laughs> if I go too fast, slow me down. So here's, here's the image we were looking at. Uh, this is the existing conditions, of course. This site went amalgamated and it's our intention to, after approvals, uh, it, it, uh, 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 consolidate the site into a single site that will be about 12.2 acres. Uh, uh, Jason, why don't we go to the site plan if we have that next. And this is just an illustrative uh, site plan showing that 12.2 acres and how it will look and behave. Uh, the two retail stores that are currently the, uh, uh, the urgent care center and the uh, lumber liquidator slash Mr. Shower Door will be removed. And, and, and in doing so, the, uh, the zoning nonconformities, which are many attendant to those sites will be cured. And then their place will be two, uh, I'll refer to them as outbuildings. They really don't have a, 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 an affirmed use yet. They are really part of the site plan because they provide the extraordinary access to and from uh, the supermarket in the back. Uh, but uh, the MBI building will also be removed and a smaller building, uh, 91,600 square feet, as opposed to the 110,000 square feet MBI building will be built. It will be located behind the uh, bowling alley and up against the, uh, the Ashley Furniture Store and the 10-story um, office building. It will actually be, you know, tucked in uh, to that space because as you'll see, I think we have some photos later, the elevation of those buildings to the north is substantially higher as I mentioned before. Uh, to the uh, east of the food store is the parking deck, which is uh, located of course, the, the lowest level at the grade level. And then the upper level uh, really is about the level of the properties to the north of it. So that too is able to be tucked into the space uh, uh, nicely. Uh, and it won't be visible at all from uh, Route 1, and nor will it be visible because of the landscaping that appears in front of it from uh, Keeler Avenue. And of course, the, uh, it's completely invisible from uh, Richards. The, um, the garage is connected uh, to the store via a, well, I'll call it a, a bridge, sky bridge as at the second level. And of course, the very active uh, street facade for the store at the uh, grade level. You'll be able to access, as you see off of Keeler, uh, and you'll be able to uh, drive right into the lowest level of the garage or take that gentle ramp up to the upper level of the garage and park there and walk into the store. 
uh, you'll, if you're also arriving by car and uh, you are coming from uh, probably the east or west, uh, you, but more likely from the east, you're either going to go down to the Keeler uh, Avenue intersection, I, uh, excuse me, uh, entrance, uh, or proceed straight headed west and wind up at the uh, currently signalized intersection by the Wells Fargo Bank. And at that point, you can drive in or out uh, of the uh, upper level of the garage directly because of that elevation change. And that driveway will, of course, be all reworked and amenitized, and it'll be an attractive way into the parking facility. If you are coming from the uh, west, headed east along Connecticut Ave, uh, and you get to where the urgent care center used to be and where the new retail building will be in, you can take a right turn in <clears throat> there, or if you wanna exit a right turn out, and this drive entrance will be reworked so that the grade runs downward and you arrive at the, we call it the main street entrance, and we'll show you some image of that. And you'll be able to pull into the lowest level of the parking facility. If you are driving from any place in the south, depending on whether it's the southeast or southwest, you'll have different points of access uh, from the others. You won't be using Connecticut Avenue, of course. You'll be coming up from, uh, say, uh, uh, Keeler, and you'll be traveling under I-95, and you can take the left right in or out. Uh, if you're traveling in the other uh, from the southwest, you can do the same at Richards. And I suppose you'd always have the option if you were coming from the east, northeast, to go down Richards as well and pull in through the, where the American Cancer Society, Society Drive is. Um, lastly, I'll say for truck traffic, now trucks are a captive audience. We can regulate that very, very well because they're ours, they're our purveyors. They will be, all be directed to the Richards Avenue site, I mean, a uh, driveway. And from there, they will be able to both uh, gain ingress and egress and uh, perform all their operational moves uh, in the area behind the store. So we think this is kind of an extraordinary site plan in that the traffic uh, uh, points of access are varied in many, uh, and they handle the access uh, by uh, for that, that, notwithstanding where it originates in kind of a unique way. It can be coming from the, from the north, the south, the east, or the west, and you're always going to have a nice way in that's most convenient. And a lot of the traffic is going to be diverted off of the Connecticut Avenue corridor. Um, our traffic experts can talk about this in much more detail than I have. I know that they have worked hard with the t uh, transportation folks and Norwalk with Mr. Travers and Mr. Boella to, to discuss all kinds of options, uh, including options that, uh, frankly, at one point didn't have any uh, ingress and egress off of Connecticut Avenue. But this is uh, universally accepted as a much, much improved and a very good uh, operational system. Um, as you arrive in the store itself, um, and Jason, do we have any of the uh, renderings uh, nearby on this slide deck? Yeah, yeah well, we can see that. That's a great photo. That, that's what's there now. That is in the parking lot of uh, MBI shortly after you enter from Keeler. And you see the expanse of parking that's there. And then you see the MBI building, uh, the one-story building in the uh, foreground here. And in the background, you see the larger, uh, more modern office building that has its front door on Richards. To the left of this in that green area would be I-95. Uh, this is an image, you know, it, do we have the image of the uh, urgent care center arrival right now? It's, uh, yes, this is, oh. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah, before we get to it. Uh, I don't know that we have that one in our. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, this is fine. This would be, you know, a moment ago, I said there's a right turn in off of Connecticut Avenue, a right turn in and a right turn out drive in the vicinity on the property of the current urgent care center. Uh, this is a rendering showing you what the, uh, the arrival looks like as it slopes down to the store. So on the right hand uh, of the side, of course, on the right, on the passenger side of that white vehicle is the, uh, the, the, front, the front facade 
of the Wegmans food market. And on the left is the, uh, the parking deck. And so this has really been designed by uh, Stephen as a architects to look like a collection of buildings as you arrive down the entry drive. Uh, and you are uh, either going to park, drop somebody off, or pick something up, and then proceed out. That's the image. Uh, and that, is, if the parking garage weren't there, that is what the organization of the, of the facade looks like as it faces to the east. So that's the front of the building. And obviously, you see where the, the front door is, and it would operate as the, the uh, that you would expect a supermarket to. What's a little different, of course, is uh, leads us to the text change we have. Uh, the clock tower, which is a signature feature on many of these, uh, is located in the uh, southeast uh, corner of the building. Uh, and uh, I should say the entire property, as is all the surrounding properties here, are in the B1 zone. These are all permitted uses. What's not permitted, oddly, maybe not so oddly, but we, we thought a little oddly, What's not permitted is a tall architectural element like a clock tower in the B1 zone. So one of our text changes that you have before you tonight is uh, a permission to uh, allow that by way of special permit. And that is one of our special permit uh, requests. Uh, th there was no great uh, uh, draftsmanship behind the special, uh, between, behind the uh, language allowing the clock tower. We simply, uh, cut and pasted uh, the words that allow that same architectural feature to exist in the CBD zone, uh, but implemented it, uh, proposed it to be implemented in the B1 zone with the added protection, if you will, or process that it be permitted by way of special permit so that you have some control over when and where it goes and the context it goes in. The other piece of the site plan that we have, uh, excuse me, zoning text change that we have proposed is allowing the uh, parking garage, the parking facility, uh, the two deck parking facility to go in. Presently, that is not allowed. Uh, we have uh, required that it be set back uh, 200 feet and that it uh, be uh, suitably landscaped uh, 200 feet from the center line of any, the closest street unless that street is I-95, that is an exemption from the 200 foot setback uh, and that uh, it be uh, uh, activated by way of a special permit as well. And that too uh, is one of our special permit requests. Um, Mr. Hennessy, uh, I, I apologize. I didn't notice this before, but uh, we have a commission member who has her hand up. Oh, <clears throat> I presume she has a question. No need, uh, Jacqueline, to uh, raise your hand. You can just speak up. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a question in regards to traffic um, on Connecticut Avenue and how it is going to be eased. Um, you mentioned during your presentation that your access points will be from Keela um, as well as from Connecticut Avenue. Um, will there be a third access point? possibly from Flax Hill? Um, Flax Hill is not proposed. Uh, the, what is proposed is from Richards. Oh, Richards, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, so yes, there is. Uh, and that will, be, uh, that will be available for uh, customer usage, but it will also be uh, all truck traffic, delivery vehicles is what I'm trying to say all delivery vehicles but will be required to access that, to use that driveway. So there's actually three streets and four points of ingress and egress. There is Richards, which I guess you could call Flax, if, you know, depending on how far right. you drive. <laughs> when you said Flax, I was like, I guess, but where, 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 where's the change? Uh, there, there's uh, Richards, there's Keeler, and then there's the two uh, existing curb cuts on Connecticut Avenue. Interestingly, we aren't adding any more curb cuts to this. We're just improving the two on Connecticut Avenue uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, ones on um, uh, uh, Keeler and uh, uh, Richards. They already exist. So there's no more curb cuts. They're just improved uh, and there's four in total. Does that answer your question? And all the access points, are they both in and out, they, they both will have in and out access or is one like dedicated to any of the 
the ones that are catered to out. They're all in and out with, with a footnote. The, the, the westernmost one on Connecticut Avenue is restricted to right-hand turns in and right-hand turns out. So it, it's designed really to capture the uh, customer who is traveling from the west and it allows that customer and others, you know, to not have to wait till they get to the traffic light. They can right. ease right into the store without going, without putting further pressure on the uh, traffic light. And they can do the same thing when exiting. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Shulman, maybe this is a good time for me to stop talking and see if there's other questions. Uh, I had one question, Attorney Hennessy. Um, are you planning, I know staff put this in the memo, I don't know if you saw it yet about solar on the roof and over the parking deck. I thought that right. was a, an interesting suggestion. Right, you know, it, it, Steve is probably the best to talk about this because he's designed so many of these doors. It, it turns out that the roof of a uh, supermarket is a difficult place to uh, play solar panels because there, there's a lot of stuff up there. Uh, the, these are stores with a lot of uh, refrigeration, AC, a lot of the, uh, the infrastructure of the store tends to be on the roof. So unlike maybe a, a warehouse club or something like that, which tends to have a great big flat exposed roof, th this roof isn't like that. Uh, the parking deck roof is designed to be as open and as, uh, uh, I would say, uh, friendly as possible. And, um, and on top of it all, uh, Steve will tell you that, that at this point in time, there's not a great, frankly, return on, on, the, on the solar aspects of this. So at this time, you know, Wegmans would, I, I think, defer, Steve, I'll let you talk to this, just based on your experience. Wegmans is, you know, as well, as you know, very focused on sustainability, but I think where they're putting their resources to things that would have a greater impact uh, for their business and the planet. But Steve, maybe maybe you're better suited to, to answer the question than I am. I no, mean, did very well. But again, uh, going back, you know, sustainability is our one of our top priorities. Reducing our carbon footprint is extremely important to us. We I did see the memo. Uh, I do understand the request and we are, diligently looking into uh, opportunities for solar panels uh, on the building or the and or the parking garage. Uh, Bill stated some of the challenges that go along with that. I would add to that that the upper levels of the food market and the upper level of the parking deck are going to be very similar to the grade of Route 95, which is running next running right next door to it. So you would have to look at glare studies and all of that and the impacts of actually having solar panels. And we also want it to be safe for our customers. So we have a lot of customers moving out in the parking lot. So any uh, issues that we have with that. So we're looking into all of that. The, the one part of the memo that I will briefly comment on, and that's that you could sell if my understanding reading it was sell back to the public utility because of some new uh, code. Um, if we, our preliminary look at this, and we've only had a couple of days to look at it, is if we put as many solar panels on the roof of this food market as we could, it would only produce between four and 8% of our total energy consumption of the building itself. So there would never be any uh, extra to, to push back into the grid. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. We are taking a look at it. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. I think we would very much welcome um, uh, you to take a um, good hard look at that. Um, it's um, a clearly an issue for us. Um, we're, we're trying to uh, encourage um to the extent that we can uh the use of uh solar uh panels um so uh, we would welcome a presentation on that um separately from uh, the rest of the application 
um, so that uh, we can have a um, frank and um, open uh, discussion uh, about that. Uh, I have uh, another uh, question. Um, you have a lot of stores, so I'm there. There must be um, other locations um, where you have um, uh, additional retail that's not Wegmans, and it looks as if there are two opportunities here for some kind of uh, retail or other use in these additional buildings you're putting up. Um, can you give us any idea? I mean, we. we any idea of uh, what type of uses uh, you you normally look for uh, in um, uh, those kinds of uh, um, buildings that are uh, uh, a part of the development? Sure, it, it, they would be uses that would be compatible with the food market it's, itself. Um, quite frankly, those uh, retail buildings that that we are showing on there have become part of this project because of the need to acquire additional real estate in order to make the traffic work. So we'd never really intended to own the Wells Fargo piece, but we needed access to get to the traffic, traffic signal. And that was in discussion with staff that was something that we felt we needed to make this project move forward. So now we have that. And the same thing with the lumber liquidators piece. So we're looking at opportunities for those two retail bar uh, uh, buildings, but it would be something that would be compatible with, our, with the food market. All right. Well, again, as you move forward, um, um, we uh, welcome um, any additional information you can provide uh, on um, how, how you're going to use those buildings and if you know uh, who the tenants might be. Okay, thank you. We will keep you up to breath. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions from uh, commission members? Lou, if I may add. Please go. Um, I'm not sure if this is for Mr. Lady or Mr. Hennessy. Um, so the urgent care facility that's there is going to stay? Uh, no. No, the that was urgent... one of the businesses. You bought those businesses or they were no. leasing the space? No. Well, the urgent care facility needs to be removed so that the, the right in, right out that's at that location can be moved over so that it, it functions properly. Okay, so they are also just a tenant in that space? They are a tenant in that space. Okay, well, hopefully they can relocate because I think it's a popular place. Um, and also, I, I, I'm not a traffic study engineer and I did try to slog through some of the, um, some of the report, but just a concern that when you when an automobile exits um, I-95 down by uh, the Darien border at holiday times uh, going by the hotel and going into Costco, that is such a quagmire. Um, I know there is a, a part of your report studied the whole uh, Connecticut Avenue corridor for 1.95 miles. So I really, um, you know, maybe having Wegmans there, will, most people will drive by Costco, and so it won't be so bad. <laughs> that's but um, that's really such a bad space. And I see here on your pretty rendering that you have a sidewalk, and it's virtually impossible to walk along Connecticut Avenue. Um, so great if, you know, if you turn the sidewalk and make it run along Connecticut Avenue, not just in, because I don't know where that little person is coming from other than an automobile. Like, she just fell out of the sky there. Um, so anyway, thanks for making it look pretty and adding as much green space as you can. And maybe there are some beautiful trees left on the MBI property. There were a number when Costco went in and they were all cut down or the vast majority were cut down. So if you can save the trees, please do. Um, I think that would be um, nice of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Also, um, to piggyback off of what Tammy um, said about the sidewalk, will there be a sidewalk extension from Connecticut Avenue into your shopping plaza? Yes. There will be sidewalks. And we, and we want a pedestrian friendly development as well. Thank you. A there is a bus least. stop across the street. And so I had one other question that I, um, if I could, can you give me a comparison or maybe this is um, our, our people, but the size of your building say compared to either the Walmart across the street or the Costco and the number of parking spaces, because I was reading in your proposal that you only need to have 250, but you're having 511 or something like that. Can you just give a rough comparison on the size and the amount of parking? I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but we can certainly assemble that for you when we come back. Okay, thank you. I think it would be helpful because that Walmart parking lot is packed to the gills all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of to know, it helps us, you know, compare and contrast. The Costco parking lot is also packed to the gills and a very unpleasant experience right. um, as a consumer. So hopefully yours wouldn't be that way. Brian? Yeah, I, in the sustainability uh, aims of Wegmans, have they considered LEED certification for all their buildings, including the ones we're considering here? We have participated in some of the LEED uh, accreditation programs in the past. Quite frankly, I'm not up to speed on, on what's going on in your community right now as far as requirements, or if we would move forward with that. Thank you. I think it's something for us to very much consider as a planning and zoning commission. I also think that as uh, as you move forward, uh, given that you have about twice as many parking spaces as are required, uh, should you determine uh, that you can make do with fewer, uh, that would be another opportunity for the placement of solar panels. So if I could just briefly speak to the, uh, the comment on, on the parking and the amount of parking spaces. In the, in the past, and you'll see many, if, if you look it up, many of our food markets have parking lots in the range of 700 to 750. A few years ago, like five, six, seven years ago, we were pushing almost 800 parking spaces. But as the business has changed, the, as everybody knows, the grocery business has changed, as all retail has changed, we've lowered those numbers down we can get around, you know, the surface parking that exists there today is exactly what we're going to build. The only difference is we're going to build a second story parking deck with a significant investment on top of it so that we do not take up any additional impervious areas. So at 550 parking spaces, we have 100 to 120 employees and even more during holiday hours that are just our employees at the store. And, and with the customer trips that we expect to make a store like this successful, we, we need all of the sparking that we're proposing here. Makes sense. We have traffic and trip generation studies that can back up all of that data. Uh, other questions? I have one quick question. Um, <clears throat> in reading the, uh, the traffic and parking studies, there was just one part that I was wondering about. Um, it brought a lyric to a song by the Eagles into my mind. 532 cars in, 512 cars out. <laughs> Where, where did the 20 go? <laughs> I'll have to leave that up to the traffic experts. That wrote <laughs> when we appear back before you, Mr. Rowena, we'll have an answer to that. <laughs> well, I hope you'll sing it. I stuck back you out on the I-95. <laughs> I wondered that too, Richard. <laughs>
Uh, well, folks, uh, Mr. Shulman, I'll, I'll take the cue from you. We, I, I would say, you know, my clients are very anxious to get this process moving. Uh, and we'd, we'd appreciate uh, your help in that regard. Well, you know, let me say that um, I, I, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, um, I know we're, we're um, very happy uh, at uh, uh, the prospect of uh, Wegmans coming to uh, Norwalk. And um, we will do everything we can um, within our responsibility um, to, to uh, move this forward. Uh, with with um, uh, taking into account uh, the um, uh, comments and uh, recommendations of, of our staff. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any final questions uh, be before we um, close this out? Right. And I have a question for uh, the staff. And uh, that is, um, do we um, have a preliminary date for uh, public hearing on this matter? Uh, so the two most likely dates would be your July meetings, um, which are either the July 7th meeting or the July 20th. Um, you know, Mr. Hennessy might've had a conflict with a later July meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if the 7th would work or if the 20th based on comments and feedback and getting, you know, everything turn around to us. Okay. I have one question. Um, when you say it's, you're, you are always making a great effort towards sustainability, I'd like to know what that means. You know, what is it you're doing to uh, see to it that your operation is pointed towards sustainability? And why is it that if the leads standards are not appropriate, what is it you're doing that make up for the lack of being able to comply with the lead standards? Is that sure. make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let me try to answer that. And I'm not an architect. So our, our buildings are almost lead compliant without any changes whatsoever. We have a number of state of the art things that we're doing inside of the building and outside of the building with refrigerant and LED lighting and uh, pumps and power, right? That all of our, a lot of our cases on the inside of our store in the old, old days, you used to have open cases, right? Where you go in and pick the food up. Almost all of our cases are, are have glass doors on them now. So we're doing, I, I could go on and on about this. As far as the building goes, we're very close to, and again, I'm not an architect, so don't quote me, but we're very close to the LEED standard anyways. From the sustainability uh, aspect, I thought in my presentation, I kind of went through, I picked three or four uh, items that we are absolutely doing as far as packaging and, and trucks and getting rid of all of our plastic bags. Uh, and, and there's a number of things and it is in our top priority list at Wegmans to be sustainable and be kind to our earth. I guess as we go forward, I'd like to, you know, continue this discussion so that I have a real understanding of what all of that means. Of course, of course. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Shulman, uh, I, I want to thank Mr. Baker for remembering I, I mentioned I might have a conflict uh, for your second July date. In fact, I don't. Um, so I, I checked that out with my wife, Brian, but thank you for remembering. All that said, we, we'd prefer to get this moving sooner rather than later. Um, so, and we feel like we're ready. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, just a comment. Sure, go ahead, Michael. Uh, on that uh, earlier subject of solar panels, uh, just 
uh, remember that you could protect your customers with uh, canopies of solar panels that protect, you know, shade, shade cars and protect them from sun and rain on that upper level deck. Uh, that can be done in possibly a creative way. Uh, it's certainly done out in the West and the Southwest uh, uh, commonly. But uh, just think about it, that's all. It, it would uh, might reduce the urban heat island effect of all that pavement. Uh, and uh, in lieu of trees up there on that garage, this would be you know, something that would provide shade uh, as well. And uh, I think make it more hospitable to park there, especially on a hot sunny day or on a snowy day in the winter uh, to, to have uh, something over your head, over your car. The aisles would still be open the canopies are over the cars. Anyway, just throwing it out there. I've seen plenty of images uh, in recent years of that happening. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, anything else? All right, if not, uh, we uh, look forward uh, hopefully to uh, um, meeting with you again in uh, July. Thank hopefully. you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, um, let's see, for this next uh, segment for the public hearing, um, JJ, um, I'm gonna have to knock uh, you off to allow uh, both uh, Darius and Hector. Um, feel free to completely participate in uh, the conversation, ask your questions. Um, uh, because uh, we don't want to lose your input. Thank you. I will be tuning in. Good. All right. With that, we'll move on to the uh, public hearing 2022-05 R slash M slash SP Merit Station Norwalk LLC 129 Glover Avenue uh, LLC slash 135 Glover Avenue, LLC slash 156 Glover Avenue, LLC slash 201 Glover Avenue, LLC Building and Land Technology, North 7, 67, 69, 79, 87, 111, 117, 129, 135, 155, 156, and 201, Glover Avenue and 2 Oakwood Avenue. Zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment and special permit application for an executive office development park, which includes approximately 1300 dwelling units plus or minus uh, and 50,000 again, plus or minus square feet of retail within seven buildings ranging from five to 15 stories. And uh, there are three uh, items we're being asked uh, to uh, act on, uh, a map change, a text change, and a special permit. Um, we have a large number of participants with us this evening. So let me explain the um, <clears throat> process um, uh, that uh, the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, has been using for many, many years. Um, first, uh, the applicant will be given an opportunity um, to uh, describe the project um, uh, and uh, they will be welcome to bring in uh, any other members of the staff that they feel are necessary in order to uh, provide uh, as uh, complete uh, a description of uh, the project uh, as possible. Throughout that process, uh, the members of the commission uh, are free to ask uh, any qu questions uh, that they uh, wish of either the uh, uh, initial presenter um, or of the uh, other uh, team members of the um, developer. Uh, when uh, that has been completed, we will open uh, the meeting up 
uh, to the public. Um, um, we um, ask you to um, give us your name uh, and uh, your address. Um, we will uh, typically allow people to speak as long as they need to uh, in order to make the points uh, that they wish uh, to make uh, either in favor or in opposition to uh, the project. Um, we do not put a time limit uh, on your presentations, but it isn't helpful to whatever position you take uh, to speak longer than is necessary or to reiterate uh, comments that other people have made. I mean, if you simply want to say that, well, I agree with the last speakers on, on, on these issues, uh, that's fine. Uh, but to try to make a case, unless you have something new to add, um, doesn't help us in uh, trying to reach uh, a decision on this matter. Uh, all we ask is that speakers uh, be respectful. Um, um, and, and that has always been our experience. But should that not happen, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll be cut off uh, from uh, speaking. Um, we, it's my intention uh, to end this meeting by 10 o'clock. Um, uh, uh, by 10 o'clock, uh, we would have been, that is the commission members, would have been in this meeting for four hours. Um, uh, an extraordinarily long time during which uh, we need to concentrate on what everybody uh, is saying, and uh, to go longer, one might even argue to go that long, uh, is not in the best interest of our making uh, the uh, best decision for the city. If, if, so if, if, if everyone has not had an opportunity to speak, um, we will end uh, the meeting but not close the hearing, and uh, we will... Um, can, can, can continue uh, this uh, conversation at our next meeting, uh, which is on uh, June 15th. Um, I, I apologize uh, for that, but in the past, um, um, running our meetings until 11, 12, one o'clock uh, in the morning, um, we're all, we've all lost uh, concentration on the matter. And it just, it's not, it's not fair to those of you who wish to speak, uh, nor is it um, fair to us. Um, following uh, the uh, opportunity of everyone to speak, um, we uh, allow uh, the uh, uh, developer to respond uh, to the comments uh, that have been made. Um, uh, after which we will uh, close uh, that portion of uh, the hearing. Um, and uh, the next step would be for uh, the members of the uh, commission to render a uh, decision uh, on this matter. Um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Attorney Waters, um, who is uh, presenting initially presenting for the developer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, uh, David Waters, I'm general counsel to Building and Land Technology and to its various related entities that are the property owners and applicants under these uh, mm -hmm. matters. Um, as, just as a preliminary matter of housekeeping, we have provided, and I note for the record, uh, evidence of mailing of uh, notices to the abutting owners as required by the regulations. Um, here with me tonight, uh, I have a few professionals that will be uh, available and, and to provide information as well. Uh, Chris Boxstyle of uh, Stiegels and Partners, uh, who is our architectural and planning uh, consultant. Uh, Don Poland from Goman and York, uh, who is our economist consultant. 
Francisco Gomes from FHI Studio, uh, who is our consultant with respect to the plan of conservation and development, and Mark Vertucci from Fuss and O'Neill, our traffic consultant on uh, a portion of the property. As uh, was noted in the preliminary comments, there are three applications that are before you this evening. The first is for zone changes to portions of the property. Uh, the property, uh, the subject property is currently partially zoned executive office zone, partially zoned AAA resident zone, and partially zoned business number two. Uh, and it would, uh, the request is to change it all to executive office zone. The second uh, application is for certain text amendments, and we'll talk through those fairly quickly. And the third is for a master plan approval by special permit. Uh, so it's a special permit application uh, to allow a master plan uh, that would be effectuated by the text amendments that would allow for such an approval. There are four operative documents that are part of the applications and, uh, and should we trust be uh, approved. And those are uh, map change surveys that were prepared by Redness and Mead uh, dated April of 2020. Uh, text amendments that uh, have been revised several times since the initial submission. The most recent revision date is May 1 of 2022. Uh, a master plan that has been uh, prepared by Spiegels and Partners. Uh, it also has been revised over time, and the current operative uh, document is dated February 28, 2022. And fourth is design standards that have been worked on collaboratively between uh, the applicant and your staff and their consultant. Uh, they're on uh, DiCarlo and Dahl letterhead and the document is dated June 2nd of 2022. With that, if I may, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. So what you see here is an aerial photograph of the area that we are talking about. And this is a, a photo from the north. At the bottom of the uh, picture, you'll see Grist Mill Road. Uh, and that forms the northern boundary of the area that we're talking about. Uh, to the right is the Route 7 Expressway, which terminates at Grist Mill Road. To the south, at the very top of the picture is the Merrick Parkway. And to the east, on the left-hand side of the uh, picture, you'll see Merritt 7 and Main Avenue. So although our area that is subject to this particular application is somewhat smaller than that full area, it really is integral to the entire community. And what you see here, so some notable features. Uh, first of all, the Danbury branch of the Metro North runs through this area right here to a train station down in this location. In addition, the Norwalk River runs in this area as well. Uh, Merritt 7, the corporate office park, you can see right here. 399 Main Avenue, a residential structure is located here. The towers at Merritt on the River, another corporate uh, office uh, complex is located here. The curb, which has recently been completed, uh, is residential, located at the northern end of, the, of things. Uh, and then there's residential, multifamily residential and commercial that is up the hill from the area that we're talking about. Looking at it from the other angle, uh, from the south. Uh, again, you can see the Merritt 7 complex, the curb. What's notable here is also that you can see the area where the high tension wires come in from Wilton to the south. And this is actually the area where the Norwalk River Valley Trail 
uh, enters the uh, area and is integral to uh, the project and to what we're proposing. On the left-hand side, you see the, in yellow dotted lines, the area that is the actual subject of the applications. Uh, as I said, it, act, the, it really has an impact on the entire uh, area here, but the yellow area is the area that is subject to uh, the applications. Most of these properties have been developed in the past as either commercial properties uh, or, uh, some other form of use. The area at the north end of things uh, has been used for parking lots specific, uh, most predominantly, uh, and that was for use by U.S. Surgical when it was located here, Vectron Labs when it was located here, and also by the Department of Transportation. The zone change can, uh, the, three, uh, the two zone change areas can be seen here on uh, the right-hand side. Um, this is the first of the three applications for the zone changes. Um, some of the area that is uh, within the project zone is already zoned executive office, and you can see that right there. There is a portion that has been zoned AAA resident zone, it's in dark green, which is proposed to be uh, changed to executive office zone. And this is actually somewhat curious because the areas that were part of the DOT right of way owned by the state of Connecticut uh, are all zoned AAA resident zone just as a placeholder. In the past, this commission has already recognized and has granted zone changes when appropriate from AAA to the adjoining zone, and that's what we are proposing to do here. Similarly, the area that's kind of in pink down here is area that is currently zoned business number two, and it is proposed to again be rezoned to executive office zone so that it is consistent with the property to the north, the property to the east, and the property to the south. Uh, I note that your staff report uh, uh, does note that this set of map amendments does make sense. We are glad to hear that, and we would request that you approve these zone changes on the basis of what we have proposed. This is one of my favorite pictures I have. I actually have it on the wall of my office. Um, it's the original master plan that I obtained a copy of from the uh, commission's uh, archives uh, for the Merit 7 corporate park. Um, the second of our applications is a text amendment uh, to allow, uh, to the zoning regulations, to allow, among other things, for approval of a master plan. The Merit 7 plan was an informal plan. Uh, remarkably, as you can see, it, it was developed at least as far as the first six buildings were concerned, uh, very consistently with what was originally proposed. Uh, but that's actually something of a wing and a prayer, the way that that was done, because there was nothing that required the applicant to continue to use that master plan, um, nor was there anything that uh, uh, gave any uh, solace to the property owner developer uh, that the commission would in fact recognize the master plan in the future. Part of the reason for that is because you cannot condition a zone change. Uh, the zone change is either approved or it's not approved. It's an up or down vote. There's no conditions that can be attached to it. However, the city wants to know and have assurances that the applicant, the developer, will not change their plans after the uh, change has been approved, and now it's a blank slate. And similarly, the, the owner wants assurances that the city won't change their mind halfway through the project uh, once the owner has invested significant amounts in the infrastructure. So the way to avoid both of those and to create certainty is to allow for approval of a master plan by special permit 
and once approved to require that all development within the plan area must be consistent with the approved master plan. So that is in essence what the text amendment does. The proposed regulations require a conceptual master plan to be submitted and approved. The conceptual master plan has a uh, general locations, orientations, uses, bulk and height of improvements, signage. It also includes design standards to fill in the gaps, to, to create some specificity with respect to the exterior look of the buildings and of the open areas and of the public areas and of the streets. Um, it then also, the regulations as proposed require that each individual building must then comply with the site plan review standards. So once the master plan is approved by special permit, each of the individual buildings must be approved by site plan review. And that would include your usual analyses that go on with site plan review that you have to maintain stable traffic flow, that the parking and loading must be adequately addressed, landscaping and screening, illumination, adequate utilities, impact on adjacent property, and in addition to your usual standards for site plan review, a specific finding that the building or improvement complies with the master plan including the design guidelines. So it's a two-step process. What we are here for tonight would be the approval of a text amendment and a master plan that would then allow for implementation by individual applications for site plan review of the buildings within the master plan. The site plan review is what each of the Merit 7 buildings uh, was required to uh, pursue. So consistent, it is consistent procedurally with what has been done in the past in this area. The proposed regulations also provide, among other things, for, for some things that I know that people are interested in. One of them is height. Uh, it allows for buildings of up to 15 stories and 150 feet. What I would remind the commission is that currently permitted within the executive office zone, are residential structures under a commercial PRD that are 11 stories and 125 feet in height. So within 25 feet of what we are proposing. Um, also allowed in the executive office zone is 12 stories and 150 feet for a hotel. And that was why we benchmarked the 150 feet because it's what's already allowed in the zone. And the stories, the number of stories, whether it's 12 stories or 15 stories is less relevant than the height is. You can have oversized stories, but it's really the height that matters the most and the 150 feet is, is what we're talking about. Further, the basis of measurement the, that is proposed in the regulations is intellectually honest in that it requires the measurement to be from the ground level. In the executive office zone, you can measure height from a plaza level, which is actually what has happened at each of the Merit 7 buildings, as well as at 801 and 901 Main Avenue at the towers. For example, 901 Main Avenue is, is an eight-story building, but it's an eight-story building on top of a plaza with five stories of garage beneath it. So it's actually a 13-story building. Uh, similarly, 801 is a 12-story building. Um, the Merritt 7 buildings and the 399 Main Avenue building are all significantly taller in and number of stories uh, than what is actually uh, by zoning calculated. Further, by having taller and buildings, you can have thinner buildings, and that actually creates a visually better way of planning things. So the first of the important pieces is height of 15 stories and 150 feet. You'll also see that the text uh, suggests that residential density should be 500 square feet per dwelling unit. Um, and it states that that is a reduction uh, or an increase <clears throat> in density 
from the 1650 that would otherwise be permitted. But that's not actually true because a commercial PRD within the executive office zone is currently allowed at 500 square feet per unit. So the density is exactly the same as what has been proposed for One Glover, for 399 Main Avenue, for the uh, buildings at the curb. David, um, can I interrupt you for just a second? Um, you're, you're using some jargon which uh, the commission members may be familiar with, but which sure. um, the, the other people who are listening may not. You mentioned, for example, PRD. Yes. Um, could you just tell everyone what, what that sure. means? So, so there is a, a permitted use within the executive office zone that is called a commercial planned residential development. Commercial planned residential development, or PRD as I, as I abbreviate it, uh, allows for a large, higher density residential use. And it is what you see at 399 Main Avenue uh, or at One Glover Avenue or at the curb. So it's, it's a, a residential use, uh, relatively high density uh, that is specifically treated and allowed by special permit within the executive office zone. Similarly, the, uh, one of the other modifications to the text is for parking and it's actually a cleanup. Um, the commission a while ago modified the required parking for uh, multifamily residential uses. Uh, and instead of the prior formula, uh, it's now a flat across the board 1.3 spaces per residential unit. Uh, unfortunately, in the zoning table for the parking table for commercial planned residential developments, uh, it's a separate line item and that one wasn't changed. So the proposal is to make it uh, the same parking requirement of 1.3 spaces per unit in a commercial PRD uh, as you would find in every other multifamily uh, development requirement in Norwalk. Also included in the uh, proposed text is a requirement that under the master plan, there must be green development techniques used, and that would include, among other things, uh, green roofs, solar, uh, blue roofs, uh, rain gardens, and things of the sort. And that's specified in the regulations. Also included in the regulations are that uh, the open space uh, be specific, and not just the 30% general requirement of open space, and open space is defined basically is everything that isn't buildings and parking. Um, the regulations require currently um, that 30% of the property uh, be open space and, and that won't change. However, what has been added in these proposed regulations is that 20% of the entire site must be public open space. So it's not just the setbacks that are used by the, the residents in, in a building. Um, it's not just the areas that are public rec or that are ec recreation areas uh, on top of a building, but now 20% of the entire site in a master plan must be public open space. Um, again, I would note that per your staff memo, um, they uh, appear to agree that the text amendments are appropriate, and we would again ask that those be approved. So now we have the framework to seek approval of a master plan because the text amendments now create the mechanism to do that and the standards under which a master plan would be reviewed and approved as a special permit. What we have here is the proposed master plan for uh, the North Seven development. And what it shows is uh, seven buildings that will contain 1,290 units uh, or up to 1,290 units and approximately 50,000 square feet of retail. The retail is shown in the hatched areas or the slashed areas and it's at the, the ground floor of this building, this building, this building, 
and these two buildings. It's proposed as a transit-oriented development. Uh, this is the location of the new train station that is being developed and uh, being constructed as we speak. Um, in addition to our own parking and development needs, in building 2.1, there is at least 83 parking spaces that are for commuter parking. That is in lieu of the 83 parking spaces, there is a paved lot that DOT has created in this approximate location. Um, when we granted them an easement and negotiated the terms of that easement, we negotiated that we would be able to put that parking within a building uh, at our expense. And that allows for this building to be in its location, but with the commuter parking located within it, separately segregated uh, so that it is just that parking and cannot be used by anybody else. We're proposing a town square in this location right across from the train station. Um, this is viewed as being kind of the, the center of the development, at least for the southern part of the development, with the retail on either side as a gathering space, as a place where events can take place, uh, as a place where just a general uh, identity of the community can occur. The retail that is proposed is, is not destination retail. This is not Costco or Wegmans or anything of the sort like that. We're talking about a coffee shop. We're talking about a dry cleaner drop off. We're talking about potentially a bank branch, something of the sort like that that is usable by the community, but is not something that draws people in because frankly, there's not enough to do that. Uh, and secondly, that is really supportive of the residents, not only of this project, but also of, again, the entire area, including Merit 7 and including the area up the hill. We have proposed a two acre park, which is located where Raccoon Brook comes through the property. Um, we look at this again as a focal point of the development. Um, we looked at and have uh, proposed connectivity. Part of the problem, as we noted, was that you have the river and the train uh, tracks that run through the development area. Now that we have a, uh, the new um, train uh, platform going in, it includes an overhead pedestrian crossing, which means that now it will be possible to walk literally from uh, the Merritt 7 buildings across to this area and back, uh, where right now you can stand on the plaza at Merritt 7 and throw a rock and hit the platform. But in order to walk there, you will have to walk at least a half a mile. Um, we've also looked at the fact that the NRVT, the Norwalk River Valley Trail, which ultimately will go from Norwalk to Danbury, uh, runs through this area. Uh, it, it's somewhat in flux, I understand, as to whether it will go on the west side of the Route 7 expressway. The rest expressway is shown in gray here, or whether it will, as originally planned, come down through Glover Avenue and then into the tunnel under the Merritt Parkway uh, at the uh, curve in Glover Avenue. The way that we have, what we have proposed is that uh, this, is, this section here is already being accounted for. The area in front of the curb, there's bike lanes that are being installed. Uh, there's an access point at the north end that will go underneath the bridge on Grist Mill Road and connect with the rest of the Norwalk River Valley Trail. The only, and ultimately it will come down here and connect to the train station. The only real question is, will it then carry on from there uh, down through and under the uh, Merritt Parkway here, or will it be something where people can connect uh, on the other side of Grist Mill to the rest of the Norwalk River Valley Trail and either travel north into Wilton or south into Norwalk. But we've proposed that that will be connected through the uh, uh, trail system that uh, is proposed. And we've proposed 
another trail that will allow uh, access through the park, up through the DOT property, and up into uh, Oak, the end of Oakwood Avenue. Similarly, we've designed this with a potential access point here that would allow people from the hillside to come down to the train station and down to uh, the, the Glover Avenue retail and, and uh, activity area without having to walk all the way down Oakwood Avenue and then back again. Uh, this would require the acquisition of uh, some consents from the adjoining property owners. It's shown for uh, only for uh, the fact that we've thought about it and would like to put it in, but ultimately it would require uh, people to consent to it in order to do that. We've also proposed, as you'll see, that uh, just as we have done up at the north end of Glover Avenue, where there's textured paving at the intersections, the same thing occurs in three other locations uh, along the rest of Glover, uh, which acts, among other things, as a traffic calming device. All of the buildings uh, are required to have active street facing uses. Uh, and that's why you see the retail, among other things, on where, where it's located. Um, we've indicated what have been called nodes of activity, which are areas where uh, points of interest occur, whether it's a piece of sculpture or a uh, seating area or an interesting uh, lighting fixture or whatever it may be. But those are all identified on the plan. Um, the plan itself, while it is proposed to be predominantly residential in nature, and we think that that's appropriate because it really, while if you look at this in a vacuum, it is almost all residential in, neighbor, in, in nature. In fact, uh, if you look at it in conjunction with what's around it, it also counterbalances the 2 million square feet of office space that is immediately around it at the towers and at Merit 7. But this is all also plug and play so that if, for example, a hotel decided that they wanted to be in this location, we could easily translate building 3.2 or 3.1 into a hotel instead of a residential structure. If Google said that they wanted to have a, an, a campus of sorts in this location, uh, again, you could change 2.2 and 2.3 or 3.1 and 3.2 into a different use. So that while this is what we have proposed and we think is probably the best development as we see it, with commission approval, it could be changed. And, and this is not a carved in stone and therefore calcified uh, master plan. It's one that will live and be able to be flexible uh, as appropriate. This master plan was referred, or actually a prior version of this master plan, was referred to the commission's consultants at DiCarlo and Dahl, uh, and an analysis was provided by DiCarlo and Dahl dated March 11th of 2020. Um, as a result of uh, the comments that had been made by uh, the commission's consultant, as well as by members of the commission, uh, further revisions were made to the planning, uh, to the planned community and to the master plan uh, dated July 23, 21, 2021 and February 28, 2022, and that is the current operative uh, document. In addition to the master plan itself, design standards have been uh, created in collaboration between uh, the city staff and its consultant to Carlo and Dahl uh, on the one hand and the applicant and its consultants on the other. And the result is that there is a uh, document that is the design standards as, as proposed by the applicant uh, that is now dated June 2nd of 2022. <clears throat> This shows the same master plan in three dimensional form. Um, it really explains that again, the 
area of the town square has some lower area. There's a more pr pronounced building at the southern end. Uh, and then the buildings here climb up Glover Avenue from 11 stories to 15 stories. Um, for the record, because this has been two years in the making since we, the original applications were made, I just want to remind the commission that there uh, are other matters that have been submitted in support of the master plan. Uh, there is a drainage analysis by Tig and Bond that is dated April 9th of 2020. There's a sanitary sewer study that was done by Tig and Bond that is dated June 5th of 2020. Um, there was an economic analysis of the project uh, by Goman and York that is dated March 23rd of 2020 um, as a result of questions from staff and uh, from uh, the commission. Uh, there were responses that were also provided by Goman and York on August the 4th of 2020 and further responses on September 2nd of 2020. And all of those are within your files and part of the record. Um, at this point, I'm gonna ask Don Poland if he would participate and just briefly summarize uh, on behalf of Goman and York, uh, the, his findings. Don? Yes, thank you, David. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairman, members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Donald Poland. I'm with the firm of Goman York, and we are located at 1137 Main Street, East Hartford, Connecticut. <clears throat> As David indicated, we had done uh, an extensive study on the economic impacts and municipal fiscal impacts of this development, uh, along with the previous application. Well, I recognize that the master plan has changed in some ways. Uh, I don't believe the relevance of our study has changed. For example, there's, I believe, 13 fewer residential units while there's 20,000 square feet of uh, retail that's being added. And ultimately, we're dealing with a very similar development. So our findings uh, generally were that this would be a fiscal positive for the municipality. Uh, I believe our findings was about 3.2 million more in taxes than local government expenses. And that was taken into account uh, education expenses and school aged children generated by the development. We also estimated approximately $3.7 million in one-time development fees. That is the land use permitting process, the building permitting process, and WPCA connection fees. In addition, we estimated on the economic impact side between 345 and 365 construction jobs uh, created or maintained during the period of construction and approximately 5.9 to 6.2 million in uh, consumer spending within the market area, recognizing the market area exists at a regional level, not simply uh, the local Norwalk level. So overall, our findings uh, are positive. We think this is a good development. And uh, I know last time you had had a number of questions, David mentioned, we had answered a number of questions by memos to staff and to the commission back then. I'd gladly answer questions again if you have them, but at this time I will yield back to Dave. Thank you. Members of the commission have any questions? Mr. Chairman, one question. Yep, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was trying to find the unmute. Um, I was interested in the in the um, statement that you made about the income in excess of expense to the city. Um, what do you estimate as far as the uh, number of children that would be involved in the school system? Yeah, so there were a few calculations done related to that. The first calculation comes up with what I believe was approximately 240 total, uh, 247 potential school enrollments. But in the report, I actually discussed kind of the comparisons between our units and the existing housing stock. 
your existing housing stock compared to existing enrollments. And ultimately an adjustment down was made to I believe 181 uh, projected enrollments by us. That simply put, this, this development is going to be overwhelmingly one and two bedroom units. Uh, and if you look at your existing housing stock, your existing housing stocks more than 50, more than 50% 50 of which is three bedrooms or more. And we know bedrooms are a key factor in ultimately the enrollments. So the second calculation after we adjusted to 180 uh, enrollments was then to adjust for those enrollments that would be new to district. And that ultimately affects the fiscal impact. Uh, if there are already enrollments within your district, just moving in location within the district, those are not new costs to the district. So most studies have shown, and I've tracked this for a number of years now, most studies show between uh, 20 and 30% of enrollments are new to district. We use the conservative estimate of 50%. Uh, that's assuming maybe some backfill on uh, enrollments that move. So ultimately we came up with, I believe it was approximately 81 uh, new enrollments or 91 new enrollments into the school district and about $2.3 million in education costs associated with those uh, enrollments. And those are backed out of the total tax value, which ultimately then results in the 3 million plus that I mentioned as the fiscal positive. Thank you, I appreciate that explanation. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I'd like to point out is that we went to the extraordinary effort of getting this economic analysis. I know that frequently you are asked uh, by members of the public, what's the economic analysis? How do we know that this isn't this going to actually cost the city money? Uh, what are we supposed to be? How can you make a decision on this without knowing the economics? We went through the effort of making sure that we could comfortably give you the information on what this does. What's the impact of this development? Uh, because we felt that that was important and it was something that was necessary for you to be able to analyze uh, and get this done. The other thing that I will point out, um, since just recently there was a large uh, conveyance uh, of the Waypoint properties in Norwalk, what is not included in uh, Dr. Poland's analysis is conveyance taxes. Uh, and while we certainly don't expect that we're going to build these buildings and turn them over and sell them to somebody else immediately, the reality is that these buildings uh, will create significant conveyance taxes if and when they do uh, uh, sell and, and transfer to other property owners. In addition to our economic analysis, we also um, did an assessment of compliance of this development with the plan of conservation and development. Uh, we retained uh, Fitzgerald and Halliday Inc., uh, now known as FHI Studio, uh, to do an assessment of that compliance. And uh, that assessment has been submitted to you uh, in written form. It's dated March 11th of 2020. Uh, Francisco Gomes is also here uh, as one of our consultants, and at this point, Francisco, if you could give a brief summary of, of your findings and, with respect to the plan of conservation and development. Uh, happy to, David. And uh, as stated for, for the record, Francisco Gomes with FHI Studio. We are located at uh, 416 Asylum Street in Hartford. Uh, so we're a local firm, and we've done quite a bit of work in Norwalk. Uh, we were asked to review this uh, development proposal for consistency with the plan of conservation and development. Uh, the expertise that we bring to this work includes uh, about a dozen plans of conservation and development that we uh, have drafted for communities across Connecticut. And so we understand the purpose of these plans and the role that they play in guiding development. And the, the plan of conservation and development, it, it really provides the framework for development in any community. And more importantly, it is the foundation for your zoning. 
Uh, so a review of that of the plan, and I should say a recently completed plan, that being the 2019 to 2029 plan, uh, I, I think was a, a very important part of this process. And we were happy to conduct it uh, on behalf of BLT. Ultimately, what we found was that the plan or the proposed project is highly supported by uh, and consistent with the 2019-2029 plan of conservation and development. And that really begins with the plan's vision statement, which includes a, a description of Norwalk as being a place with a dynamic economy, varied housing choices, and opportunities for bicycling and walking, uh, all of which are reflected in this development proposal. Uh, furthermore, uh, this development proposal addresses many of the issues or concerns surrounding development in Norwalk. Um, by example, and as David noted earlier, the, the green infrastructure and low impact design uh, techniques that have been introduced as part of this proposal address many of the concerns surrounding impervious uh, surface and uh, urban heat island effect that, that have been discussed already. Uh, furthermore, uh, the concerns related to traffic generated by parking uh, by uh, new development uh, was something uh, discussed at length in the plan of conservation and development. And uh, it's, yeah, I think it's really uh, important to point out that this is a transit oriented development that is in, intended to uh, uh, build upon the existing transit service and link to that service. Uh, as a means uh, of, uh, as one of its primary means of transportation. Uh, so to the effect that this is a TOD project, it, it really is responsive to that need to balance transportation uh, choices as expressed by the POCD. Ultimately, I think uh, one of the most informative and telling um, parts of the POCD as related to this development site is in the future land use section of the plan. And within that future land use section, there's a passage that states the following. It, it says, healthy, vibrant cities are constantly evolving in big and small ways to remain desirable by meeting changing demands. In healthy cities, new uses emerge, old buildings are renovated and repurposed and new buildings are built. And so that provides the overall vision for uh, the role of development, redevelopment, and, and uh, infill development in Norwalk. Uh, the future land use map itself identifies the Merritt 7 area as a mixed use center. And that mixed use center is, is intended to include medium to high density office, residential, retail, hotels, entertainment areas, uh, all accessible by transit. Furthermore, there is a separate land use policy map, and the land use policy map identifies the Merritt 7 area as an activity center. And those activity centers are intended to be places that have a mixture of uses and are access accessible by a variety of means of transportation. So in, in summary, we found that this development proposal is, is extremely consistent with the plan of conservation and development and that many of the concerns regarding uh, development expressed by the plan are in part or in whole addressed uh, by many of the features of, of this development uh, proposal. And, and with that said, I'll, I'll turn it back over to David and, and yield to any questions that uh, any of the commissioners might have. Are there any questions of uh, Mr. Gomes? Lou, I don't have a question of Mr. Gomes, but could we go back to Mr. Poland, please? Certainly. Thank you. Um, Mr. Poland, did your study also take into account um, the, any additional costs, police, fire, and other municipal services? And is that reflected in that $3.2 annual revenue to the city? Don, if you're trying to speak, you're on mute. <laughs> My apologies. Could she re-ask uh, re the question? Sure. Um, 
I'm wondering if your study took into um, consideration um, the additional need for extra police, fire, you know, is there new fire apparatus needed for those buildings at that height and any other municipal services that are not part of the school system? And yeah, we, is that part of your 3.2 million in revenue, annual revenue? Yes, we did consider the uh, municipal government services and also considered things like existing zoning regulations, which allow certain heights and so forth. Therefore, without going above, uh, without going above the heights already allowed within the zoning, we wouldn't assume that new fire equipment is actually needed to reach those heights and access those buildings. Uh, the <clears throat> typically we estimate about thirty percent of municipal of uh, commercial taxes and about 20% of residential taxes pay for general government okay. expenditures. And once again, at 3.2 million in positive fiscal impact, uh, we know that we're not creating a negative impact on general government services. I believe in one of my memos uh, with questions being answered back in 2020, I had stated that it would take like another 227 school enrollments to actually drive the development into a fiscal negative uh, position. So we don't see any negative impacts on general government services or fire and other services. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. And Chairman. Brian, go ahead. Oh, sorry. A question for Attorney Waters, if I may. Just yes. clarification. The, yes. 100, the 150 feet, does that include the parking and any, obviously, development above that in terms of floors? I was slightly confused with your statements about uh, what's happening on the merit. Yes. So it does. Certainly. Okay. okay. Certainly. So let, let, me, let me explain that and clarify it. That what when we talk in this master plan, about the 150 feet, we are talking about measuring it from ground level. So if you look, for example, at uh, building 2.1 right here, there's an area that is uh, retail, There's then there's parking above that, and then there is the residential above that. We're measuring it from the ground. Or similarly, if you look over here at 3.1 and 3.2, we're measuring from the ground, not from the plaza level uh, that is uh, where above the garage. In typically in the Merit 7 buildings, in the Towers buildings at 801 and 901 and 45 Glover, um, and actually also in the building at 399 Main Avenue, the residential building there, the measurement is from the plaza level. So that if you think about the Merit 7 buildings, if you're coming in off of Main Avenue, you kind of drive in and you go up a, a ramp to the plaza deck. That's ground zero that you measure height from for zoning purposes uh, in, in the Merit 7 complex. But clearly there's you know, four stories of parking below it that doesn't count. Uh, but yet, if you were to go around the back of the building and are on Glover Avenue looking at the backs of the buildings, you would definitely see four stories of parking. So when we talk about the 150 feet and the 15 stories, we're talking about all in, uh, measured from ground level, not from a, a plaza deck that is above ground level. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the, the thing that I would like to just go on, go back to on the um, plan of conservation <coughs> and development is to, to let you know um, the timing on our application. Uh, as you know, it's been two years since we first filed our application, but actually our application was ready and ready to be filed almost three years ago. We did not file it then, and we intentionally did not even reach out to uh, the commission or staff at that point because the commission, and that point the commissions, were in the process of reviewing and creating and approving the plan of conservation and development. And we did not want our project to now become 
somehow a, a compelling uh, interest in how you decided you wanted to uh, look at the plan of conservation and development. So we waited until the plan of conservation and development had been adopted and then made sure that our master plan complied with it rather than going ahead and uh, starting the process in advance. So we wanted to be sure that your process wasn't tainted by thinking about what might be coming down the line. So the, the plan of conservation and development was completely independent of our development. Our development came right on the heels of it. So it, it would be difficult to argue that uh, somehow it's you know eight years into the plan of conservation and development and things have changed. Uh, it, it was filed immediately after the plan of conservation and development uh, was approved. The other, one of the other areas that we have submitted additional documentation on has to do with traffic. And that clearly is an interesting topic for, for this development. Um, we did submit a traffic impact study by Tig and Bond uh, dated April 9 of 2020. And it, did, it was an analysis of what is the existing traffic uh, and uh, for the area and what could be expected to some extent, but it was mostly a what is the status quo? The commission then asked us to go further and we did with a traffic impact study again by Tigan Bond dated February of 2021 where we looked at what would be the potential uh, impact of this further development. Those traffic impact studies were reviewed by your consultant, uh, DiCarlo and Dahl, uh, and their written review was uh, dated June 18 of 2021. The result of that was that we acknowledge and, and we collectively with your staff have, have agreed that the property, the project really needs to be broken into three phases. The first phase is, is the three buildings that are at the southern end of the development. And that we call phase one. And it's approximately 500 residential units uh, and, and some associated retail and in the three buildings. Um, what it, what we were able to conclude, and we'll get to in a minute, is that those three buildings uh, with very minimal uh, effort and improvement can be built without any significant impact on the traffic uh, dynamic within the area. However, to build 2.2 and 2.3, which we deem phase two, there would be needed significant offsite uh, traffic improvements to the region and to the area. And to build 3.1 and 3.2, there would be further traffic improvements that would be required. So we have acknowledged that the, in order to build beyond the first three buildings, and we wanted these to be the first three buildings because they're around the train station, they support the community, and they also include the, the commuter parking for the train station. Uh, but that to do that, we would be able to do that in, all, relatively immediately with very little effort on the traffic end of things. The other two would require um, these significant other improvements, and I'll talk about those in a minute. However, what I'd like to do at this point is to note that we also submitted a preliminary uh, traffic impact study that was prepared by Fuss and O'Neill dated August 9th of 2021 to look at the first phase of the development to see if it was feasible. Again, the reason for this is because there's no reason to approve a master plan if you're never gonna be able to build it because you can't address the traffic issues. So we did in fact, uh, commission uh, and a further analysis for phase one only. Um, and Mark Vertucci of Fusset O'Neill is, is present. And at this point, I would ask him 
uh, if he would uh, please quickly summarize his findings mm -hmm. with respect to that phase one. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening, uh, Mark Fertucci. I'm a senior transportation engineer uh, at Fuss and O'Neill in Manchester. Uh, also a registered professional engineer in Connecticut and a professional traffic operations engineer. Uh, as Dave mentioned, we, uh, we prepared a traffic impact statement for the first phase of this project and uh, I'll briefly describe our findings. Um, you know, the site is, is shown here being located on Glover Avenue. Uh, People really have two ways in. They can come in from Grist Mill Road and uh, the Route 7 Expressway Terminus from the north, or they can exit uh, to the south uh, via Main Avenue uh, near the Merritt to Parkway interchange. So uh, the site really has excellent access um, to the surrounding um, expressway system to Route 7 and ultimately a 95 yeah. and the Merritt Parkway uh, as well. Uh, it also has terrific transit access with the train station being uh, right here. So that's that's going to encourage people uh, you know, to walk to the station and, and not uh, even get in their cars. So that's, that's significantly going to reduce the, uh, the traffic uh, load coming out of this project. Um, so what we did in this study is we, we took a look at the, the, the key intersections um, within the project area. Uh, so uh, Glover Avenue at Main Avenue and the Route 15 ramps, uh, and then to the north of the of the site, we looked at Glover uh, Avenue at uh, Grist Mill, uh, Grist Mill Road at the Route 7 Expressway Terminus, and Grist Mill Road at, at Main Avenue. Uh, these are all um, intersections, they're, they're state-maintained intersections under, under DOT purview. Um, so we uh, obtained traffic counts from the Department of Transportation for, uh, for those intersections, and we looked at a 2024 design year. Um, for the project, as far as what it will generate for phase one uh, for traffic, we utilize rates in the industry standard ITE trip generation manual. Um, and for the, for the phase one, which uh, as Dave mentioned is about 500 residential units and about 28,000 28, square feet of supporting retail. Uh, the manual projects will have 78 entering and, and 136 exiting trips in the morning peak hour and 171 entering and 125 exiting trips in the afternoon peak hour. Uh, so these, these trips um, are really not that significant. And, and the reason, uh, it, you know, this back to the fact that, uh, again, this is a transit oriented development. So you're going to have a substantial number of people uh, not getting in their in their vehicle to, to commute to work. Um, they're going to walk, uh, walk to the train station or, or work from the work from their homes. Also, um, there'll be a, a substantial amount of captured traffic. This retail component is really a supporting retail for uh, the residences and for uh, the adjacent uh, Merit Seven off offices. So uh, you, again, you're going to get a lot of a lot of the traffic generation from that retail is going to be uh, walkers uh, on foot, uh, not additional trips to the road network. Uh, so we added this traffic to our baseline volumes and we conducted a capacity analysis at each of our uh, study intersections. Uh, during the peak hours, we compared the baseline 2024 condition without the development traffic to the condition uh, to 2024 condition with the development traffic added. And what we found is there was no noticeable increase in vehicle delays at any of the uh, study intersections and no noticeable increase in vehicle queues at the majority of the intersection approaches. Queue increases were about a vehicle length or less on average. So the findings of our study uh, were that the proposed phase one development will not have a significant impact, a significant traffic impact on the adjacent uh, road network. Uh, I wanna point out that um, we did submit uh, this study as well to the, to the DOT, to the State Traffic Administration for a preliminary scoping level review. And the DOT did concur with the findings of our study of, of no significant impact. They only had one comment uh, they've asked us to extend the uh, westbound left turn lane on Grist Mill Road into Glover Avenue, that, and that can be accomplished with a, a simple restriping over the, the bridge there over the river. Um, but, but no other offsite improvements uh, 
would be required uh, according to the Department of Transportation. And of course, should this get approved, we will have to go through the DOT through the formal OSTA certificate application process, at which point they'll, uh, they'll you know, complete their review. Uh, but uh, with that, I can take any questions or I can, I can turn it back to Attorney Waters. Uh, Mr. Vertucci, um, probably both a comment and a question. Sure. Um, I, I, I think a, a serious um, safety hazard has been overlooked uh, in your study. And um, that is uh, the walk on Grist Mill Road from Glover Avenue up to the uh, old Route 7. Um, there is no separation there uh, for uh, people who are walking um, and uh, cars are traveling at uh, fairly high speeds along that stress, uh, stretch of road. Um, so that, uh, again, I can't speak for everyone on the commission, uh, but I know that many of us have uh, expressed concern that what's needed is a, a raised sidewalk uh, running from, from uh, uh, Glover Avenue up to uh, Route 7. Yeah, I think, you know, as this, as this uh, master plan gets developed, uh, you know, the sidewalks, some have already been installed on Glover, but that whole, uh, that whole stretch is going to be uh, completed with, uh, you know, crosswalks and, and, and up, upgraded sidewalks right up to the, the Gristmill Road intersection. That's all part of this master plan. Right, but the master plan does not currently include uh, a, a raised sidewalk so that pe people can walk safely from Grist Mill to Route 7. Mr. Yep. Chairman, just to clarify, when you're saying Route 7, you mean to Main Avenue? Yeah, that's right. You call it you call it by its current name. I call it by its old name. Because it could, it could right. also be the other way to Route Seven, where the expressway is. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that uh, in discussions that we have had with the commission and also with staff, we understand that uh, the city has done an analysis that it it would be possible to create such a raised sidewalk. Uh, we certainly understand that that would be part of the uh, consideration that the commission would put into approval of this master plan. Okay, I appreciate that. Attorney Waters, quick question for you. Is, are you considering the Raccoon Creek Park as part of phase one um, improvements and development? No, uh, it is not because we really, do, until we have the buildings that surround it designed, it's kind of hard to figure out where you would- that makes sense. Where you would put it. Exactly. I, yeah. But the trade-off I think, uh, Mr. Cantor, is that uh, what will be part of it is a significant public area, which is the- uh, uh, The plaza, yeah. The plaza, the, the town square, and also the area along the front of these three buildings, which will include seating areas and what have you. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Waters, in 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 the with the building of those first three, how many of the um, those sidewalk nodes um, uh, exist? Can't tell from this drawing. There's one that's at the very southern tip of the building, uh, of 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 the property, right at that intersection with Oakwood. Um, there are two that are uh, at the uh, town square. And there are two that are at building 2.1. Okay, thank you. At this point, I'd just like to, uh, because the approval is of a special permit, I just wanna briefly run through the standards and in your regulations for special permit approval. Uh, so that we make sure that we hit everything. Uh, we've talked about density of use and bulk of buildings that in fact, the height uh, and the intensity and, and density that we're talking about are already permitted within this zone, uh, either under commercial PRD as far as density is concerned, uh, as height as far as a, a, a uh, hotel is concerned. Um, so I think that we, we've kind of addressed that. Stable traffic flow, we've talked about 
again, with stable traffic flow, I want to remind the commission that even if you approve, and we hope you will, uh, all three of these applications, it doesn't allow us to go in and get a building permit yet. We will still need to come in before you for each of the individual buildings with site plan review, and we will still have to address stable traffic flow at that point for each of those buildings. Uh, but we have demonstrated that stable traffic flow conceptually can be maintained for the entire development. And we'll get to the other offsite improvements in just a minute. Um, we, as far as availability of mass transit is concerned, that's an easy one, given the fact that we have a train station that's literally right on our doorstep. Um, and the provision of sidewalks, one of the things that is really rather good about this project is that in an area where there's been a mishmash of sidewalks uh, along Glover Avenue for quite a while, uh, it will all be improved uh, with, with acceptable sidewalks. Availability and compatibility of utilities is, has been provided um, and some of the analyses we did with sanitary sewer, among other things is, is uh, within your record. Uh, impact from noise, odor, fumes, dust, and artificial lighting. Again, it's no different than what would be permitted uh, with any other residential building, including the curb, which has been uh, already approved and is quite successful at this point. Signage is part of the package that we have submitted as part of a master plan to create a cohesive signage package. The adequacy of yards and open space, again, buffering and screening. Uh, again, open space, I think that we've not only committed to uh, what would be normally required on, in this zone, but we've committed to 20% public open space. Um, and the yards and screening are similar to what would be uh, true of any of the other developments within the executive office zone. Im impact on neighborhood properties as compared to uses and structures permitted as a matter of right. Again, these are consistent with the, the bulk and size of buildings that you would find at Merit 7, which were are permitted as a matter of right, um, subject only to site plan review. Uh, so we meet that criteria. The existing land use in the area, again, very consistent with the multifamily at the curb, the office uh, densities that are also at the uh, Merit 7 and the towers. Um, proximity of community facilities. In fact, we're providing some community facilities by way of a park um, and public square. Um, compliance with the zoning code and the plan of conservation and development. Uh, we, we certainly comply with the zoning code since we're creating the, the text that, that it goes to. And you've heard from Mr. Gomes as far as the conserv plan of conservation and development. Conservation of wetlands, watercourses, and other ecologically valuable lands. Again, not only are we pre preserving, but we're actually making Raccoon Brook uh, and its upland wetland, uh, its upland uh, protected areas into one of the gems of this development. Um, and lastly, that no zoning violation exists on the property, and to our knowledge, none does at this point. Um, one other comment that I would make, your staff memo, and this actually goes ironically to uh, uh, the question that was re just raised, um, your staff memo suggested that the park dimensions, both at the north and south side, should be clarified at this point and in this approval. And that really isn't possible because we haven't designed these buildings yet. Uh, we don't know exactly what their dimensions are. We know that these are the general dimensions. Um, we also don't have any input from the fire marshal yet as to what kind of access they may need around the buildings or not. Um, so it's really not possible to specifically define the north and south boundaries of the park. However, what we would suggest, and we have suggested this to your staff uh, in writing already, is that we would agree to a condition that the park would be a minimum of two acres, which is what is proposed here, and that it would be configured consistent with the master plan. And that will give you, upon your further review of the applications that will have to come in for site plan review, it will give you the hook that you need in order to make sure that you are getting exactly what you think you're getting. 
Now we talked about a little bit about offsite improvements in phase two and phase three. This is one conceptual plan that has been uh, promoted by DOT as a possible way to address the full interchange at the uh, Route 7, Merritt Parkway, Main Avenue. Um, what it does is it, it creates the complete interchange using ramps. There is another one that does similar with slightly less uh, impact by using a couple of uh, stoplights. Both of those are under consideration right now with DOT. They expect that they will start construction in 2025. Uh, this something of this ilk, whether it's this one or the other one or something similar to it, would need to be incorporated and developed in order to move forward with phase two. What's also important to note is that this area down here on Main Avenue uh, will include a significantly enhanced sidewalk system under the Merritt Parkway. They're actually going to replace the bridge, if I recall correctly. Um, but it right now is difficult to get out of the south end of Glover um, as a pedestrian or as a biker, and this will actually enhance that whole uh, situation. So this is actually a, a significant part, not just for traffic of a vehicular nature, but also a pedestrian nature. This has been the subject of some discussion. Uh, it is a potential way of addressing the traffic at the north end of Glover. Right now, as you know, the expressway comes up and ends at a T at, at Grist Mill. And similarly, Glover Avenue comes up and ends at a T at Grist Mill. This proposal would change it into a four-way intersection it would encourage the free flow of traffic predominantly to Main Avenue, which is what it's always in, been intended to do. Um, and then there would be additional improvements that would be made on Main Avenue from that Grist Mill intersection up through to about Gateway in Wilton. These are all on the books as being under uh, contemplated plans of DOT. Um, there is not yet a carved in stone, this is the answer, this is what we are going to do. So you, you have to take it somewhat with a grain of salt that um, these will uh, perhaps and probably be revised, changed, and, and may be completely revised before they're ever developed. But what we were asked to do was to show that the state of Connecticut has actually analyzed that we could achieve stable traffic flow for the entire development um, if certain traffic improvements are made. And so that is what this exercise does. Um, phase two, as I said, is, is in uh, DOT's review process with uh, anticipated construction commencing in 2025, which would likely fall very well within our construction of the uh, um, phase two of our master plan, because it will take us a while to build phase one out and then to get our approvals for phase two and build it out uh, in order to move forward and actually have a need for the traffic improvements at all. I would remind you also that with respect to the traffic improvements that are associated with the development of any of the master plan areas, phase one, phase two, phase three, buildings one through building seven, all of them will require further review by Norwalk, by your traffic uh, experts and by any consultants that you retain. It will require a finding by planning and zoning uh, of stable traffic flow at the time that the uh, individual site plan review is approved. And it will also require OSTA review uh, the Office of State Traffic Administrator uh, by the state DOT. So this is not the end of anything. In fact, it's just the beginning, but it demonstrates that it is in fact possible to build out the entire site uh, with improvements that can be made. One of the things that I, we thought would be instructive would also be, and it ties somewhat to what Don Poland was talking about, 
um, is the demographics of what we have currently at the curb, because it's right there. It's, it's what we have. And I, it's of some interest because it gives you an idea of what we can expect for the development and of these uh, uh, properties as well. Interestingly enough, if you look at the age distribution, um, about 38 of the uh, of, of the total residents are under the age of 18. Now that includes a significant number that are under the age of five and therefore aren't in the school system at all. Uh, but it's, it's not inconsistent at all with what uh, Don was explaining that he would expect, given the fact that this is now approaching 700 units and this is what you're getting. Interestingly enough, you'll see that almost, well, 19% of all of the residents are 55 or older. Um, so where most times you think of it as being only young people, in fact, that is not at all the case. If you look at the top employers, where do people go to work? 49 of the residents go to ASML in Wilton. Eight of them go down the expressway to the Norwalk Hospital. Seven of them go down Glover Avenue to fact set. Six are within the public schools. Five are at, down the road at Bridgewater at, at the towers. Um, it, it's not until you get down to here that you actually get into anything that's really going fairly far off base, which is the New Canaan public schools. Similarly, if you look at employer addresses and the number of residents, 78 of the <clears throat> residents 59.15.9 percent of all of the curb residents that are employed are, are working in Norwalk. Another 13 are in Wilton. So that's 30 percent of all of the residents at the curb are working in either Norwalk or Wilton. They're not going far. Then you look at the rest of it, which is Stamford, Norwalk, Westport, Greenwich, Darien, it's not until you get down to New Canaan that you see people that are likely going other than uh, on a major arterial route or mass transit. Once you get down to New Canaan, there, some of them are definitely going to be going cross country uh, in order to get to work. But the rest of these, are definitely ones that are going either by mass transit, by train, or they're going uh, down the, the expressway to 95 or to the Merit in order to get to work. And if you look at the prior residences of the residents, 22.6% were already Norwalk residents. Another 4.7% were Wilton residents. So. It, again, you're not, it's not as much an influx of people as you would expect. It's actually people that are just moving around within the Norwalk area. They're already there. This is perhaps the most compelling uh, slide that I can show you. And, the, and it goes with the question of why this plan and why now? The 16 properties that are listed here, which are the Merit 7 properties, the towers, uh, the residential properties on Glover uh, and, and Merit on the river, 16 properties are 5% of the real estate grand list of Norwalk. Think about that. 5% of the grand list of Norwalk comes from taxes generated by these 16 properties. The office market is soft. It's not, a, it's not at all a secret about that. And the days of corporate office parks are gone. What people are looking for now, what class A tenants are looking for now are experiential environments, the live, work, play environment. And why? Because they need it to attract and retain their talent, their employees. If they don't have people, employees do not want to go to a corporate office park and not be able to go out and have a beer down the street. 
They don't want to go to an office park and not and then have to commute significant distances. They want to be in an area where they can be there the entire time. If we don't provide that, not only do you not grow, not only does this engine of Norwalk not grow, but you can't maintain it either. And that can result in vacant offices, which would then result in lower rents and lower property values, which means that the assessments on these properties, especially the office buildings, go down. And that means reallocation of taxes among the residential. So it's a critical thing to be able to feed that machine that is the Merit 7 Towers office complex and make it into and uh, maintain it as a very desirable location within the city of Norwalk. I don't wanna end on doom and gloom though, because we can support the economic engine of Norwalk and create this as a TOD environment that really works. And we've really worked hard, I think, over the last couple of years with your staff and, and with input from the commission as well, to create a design for a neighborhood that supports Norwalk economy, both in revenue and in support of its corporate offices, that fulfills the goals of the POCD, that provides significant public open space, not just open space, that is committed to green initiatives, and those are spelled out and required in the regulations, and that has a clarity of development with agreed upon standards and a big picture approach. That's what we've tried to do here. So uh, thank you for your time. I know it's been a long presentation, but it's been a very, it's a big project and it's been a long time coming. Um, we look forward to your further review we hope that you will put your trust in us and we look forward to the next stage of actually designing phase one if you see fit to approve these applications. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's 8.57. Um, we've been here now for three hours. Um, I'm gonna suggest uh, we, we take uh, about a um, um, eight minute uh, uh, break so you can get a cup of coffee, um, just walk around a bit. Um, so uh, we're going to get back together uh, here at, um, let's say, 9.06. 9.06, we start up again. I, with apologies to those of you who are waiting to speak. Uh, I understand you may be frustrated, but uh, um, I think we'll be better able to hear you. Uh, if we take this brief break. I think we have a couple of people who haven't come on board yet, but um, I want to I be fair to the uh, people out there who want to comment. Um, uh, I've already uh, 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 explained that uh, this, this is your opportunity to speak. Um, we're going to be listening carefully uh, to uh, your comments, um, but your this is not a conversation um, between uh, members of the public and uh, the uh, commission members. Um, your, your, your questions, your comments should be addressed um, to um, uh, the uh, developer um, and um, he will uh, not respond until uh, everyone has had an opportunity to speak. Now, given the uh, hour and given the number of people I see participating, it may not be possible, as I said earlier, for uh, everyone to speak this evening. Uh, in the event that that's the case, um, you are uh, encouraged. Uh, to come to our uh, next meeting on uh, June fifteenth uh, to uh, to give your comments. Uh, again, you only have one opportunity to speak. So uh, when you speak, uh, please say everything that's on uh, that's on your mind. Um, with that, um, I'm going to have uh, Brian Baker explain um, how um, how you can raise your hand 
to indicate that you want to speak. Uh, so for everyone, uh, members of the public who'd like to speak in favor or in opposition of this application, you can use the raise your hand tool. It's at the bottom of your screen. You just click on that. Um, and if you're on a phone, you'll hit star nine. That will raise your hand. I can then bring you over to speak. If you do want to be on camera, I can make that happen. Just let me know when I first bring you over. With that. Good evening. My name is April Wennerstrom. I live on Oxyoke Lane. With all due respect, um, I've listened to this presentation and um, my biggest concern is how much we continue to overbuild Norwalk year after year as our grand list continues to underfund our schools. So Mr. Waters, I've been to numerous meetings of this type over the years and the frustration and dismay I have for our community leaders in this matter is at its peak, um, particularly when we're considering density and growth in an area already dense um, in the city. So. Mr. Waters is not a proposal that I could support. So I just wanted to share a couple of concerns about not only funding and, and providing educational resources through funding for families and students in Norwalk who would likely reside in this specific area. I saw some of those um, charts with um, residents of the curb. I'm very familiar with the curb as I pretty much drive by it every day. Um, and it's my belief that Route 7 and Danbury Road in this main area or main avenue cannot co accommodate this increased growth in traffic despite some of these studies. I just want you know th this group and, and particularly you to understand the frustration with the numerous amendments and requests for accommodations for this North 7 plan. And I request that the commission explain to the public or at least I will participate in the next meetings of what kind of tax breaks will this development qualify for and when will the city do its job to increase the funding for our schools? So after all these 1600 uh, units will be built over the next 10 to 15 years, we'll need to find ways to fund our schools. Um, in my community, my uh, student is a student, was a student at Cranberry, now at West Rocks and soon to be the new, new Norwalk High. So as I listened to your presentation, you indicated that some of the development may bring a uh, bank branch, and I just want this group to remember that the Bank of America and the Walmart Plaza nearby just closed, or particularly a coffee shop. Also, you know, remember that there's a bustling Panera at Starbucks less than half a mile away from this location. And I really uh, feel that to consider this as realistic businesses for the larger community rather than just the established planned apartment complex is flawed. Um, I also believe that I heard you say that traffic studies were done in 2021. Uh, while we were still in the pandemic and while many of us were still working from home. So I'm not sure the findings or conclusions that the development could be built without any significant impact would hold even with the phased approach offered by this group. So this is very concerning to me. And I listened to Mr. Vertucci um, that there would be no significant impact, but his offer to restripe through a request to the DOT to me as a resident of this area would be an impossibility. Um, if, if anyone ever drives, I think Mr. Rowena lives near this area where Main Avenue, West Rocks intersects um, near the Walmart. We've not been able to get DOT to pay any attention to that, to even just put in a green arrow so that traffic can flow in that area. Um, I'd also wanted to consider as I looked at the maps about MedVet, there's a MedVet located there. It's a 24 hour resource for many pet owners, not only in Fairfield County, but in Westchester as well. But Back to the task at hand, you know, after the recent traffic study from Wegmans, which I also sort of reviewed about 300 pages, I don't feel that traffic can be accommodated, in, you know, in this area as well. And so I would just like for the board to consider um, whether or not to approve the amendments and request the BLNT to drastically alter the community's landscape and quality of life. Um, perhaps even I'll attend the next meeting to consider halting the overbuilding in our fine city. And please, for this group, to share with the community and the public what kind of tax breaks this development will qualify for and how that will impact our uh, city residents and school children. So I appreciate your time today. And I, you know, I know it's been a long night, so thank you for all of the information you shared with us, Mr. Waters and the group. Um, thank you. Thank you.
Arlene, you just have to unmute yourself. Should be in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. <clears throat> okay, we can come back. Um, hello, this is um, Juliana Shanti. I live in the Glen Rock community, which is on Oakwood Avenue, um, one of the residential communities up the hill. Um, and there are, there are three main points that I'd like to, to touch on in, in opposition to this build, one being that was already covered by the first speaker. The traffic study was done during COVID and before the com full completion of the curb, so not representative necessarily of traffic flows. The second being that the drainage analysis and the sound pollution analysis were done before the building of, of a corporate building uh, by Route 7, which cut out a lot of trees uh, and we're already seeing you know, increased sound pollution from that. Uh, and there's flooding on the road today with just heavy rain. So, um, so I think that that's something to consider. Um, and then the third point that I haven't heard brought up is the socioeconomic impact. So, uh, you know, I haven't heard about low income accommodations for, for this housing plan, um, rent to buy options uh, to help grow wealth within Norwalk's community. You know, as we, as the city grows and becomes bigger, right, we're, we may be pricing out locals um, and, you know, gentrifying Norwalk to the point where people who have grown up here can't afford to live here. Um, and I think that that's an, an, an important point for uh, a development like this that's, you know, going to bring in a lot of revenue um, and not necessarily put that wealth in the pocket of, of people who live here um, and um, who are looking to grow wealth, uh, you know, in, in this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my name is Wes Haynes. I'm the executive director of the Merrick Parkway Conservancy, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comment uh, on behalf of the Merrick Parkway Conservancy tonight. Mr. Conserv Haynes, can you yes. give us an address, either your own address or the Conservancy's? Uh, sure. Um, my, my personal address is 22 Brightside Drive, Stamford, Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, the Conservancy is a nonprofit organization committed to the preservation, revitalization, and stewardship of Connecticut's largest historic district. The 37.5 mile Merrick Parkway is one of the greatest products of America's city beautiful era, a time when uh, at the first half of this 20th century when major public works like this road were designed to convey a sense of beauty in addition to safety and efficiency. The Merit is unusual among highways for its listing on the National Register of Historic Places and designation as a National Scenic Byway. These formal designations were made to protect its exceptional landscape and architectural bridges and its intrinsic scenic quality. Since the late 1990s, Connecticut Department of Transportation has made a great investment in rehabilitating the Merit to improve its safety and efficiency while retaining its beauty for the pleasure of the public in an estimated 25 million vehicles driving it annually. The Conservancy has uh, two concerns about this master plan. The Conservancy has been working closely with uh, CTDOT and other local stakeholders in the 715 PAC since 2010 to develop a solution to reconfiguring exits 39 and 40 to make them safer and more efficient in a way that is compatible with the Merit's scale and park-like character. Of the two alternative configurations currently under consideration, uh, uh, Attorney Waters showed one of them, but the other one that we prefer, uh, the Conservancy is satisfied that Alternative 26 accomplishes the goals that we have been working on for a long time. It is at least two thirds smaller than the first layouts proposed and about one half the size of alternative 21D and public cost of other configurations under consideration. The environmental review process in selecting this alternative has not yet concluded. And 2025 at this point appears to be a very optimistic date for construction. 
This master plan was not presented or discussed during the numerous 715 PAC meetings over the past three years. Yet the traffic impact study uh, presented tonight does not include analysis of the 715 interchange beyond noting that roadway improvements that are planned or currently in development by others for the study area transportation system are expected to mitigate existing capacity issues as well as provide additional capacity to accommodate future traffic volumes associated with the North 7 master plan. Traffic operations will be analyzed for each subsequent phase of implementation for the North 7 master plan to assess potential traffic impacts on a phase specific basis, unquote. We do not have verification from CDTODOT that alternative 26 provides the additional capacity resulting from this master plan. Should approval of this master plan result in elimination of alternative 26 from consideration, it would delay building the interchange another five years or more. We request that the commission obtain written verification from CONDOT that alternative 26 meets the capacity requirements of the new traffic resulting from the master plan or condition approval of the plan on its compatibility with alternative 26. Second, the Conservancy's other concern is the master plan's architectural guidelines. The master plan proposes building the tallest buildings to date north of the Merritt and within this view shed. There is no other place like this in Fairfield County. In deference to the parkway scenic quality and safety considerations, and out of respect to the adjacent suburban neighborhoods, the design of these tall urban buildings need to be done with great sensitivity to their existing context. Much of the context of the Merritt and its suburban surrounds is in the exposure of the sky pierced by trees, not tall buildings. The master plan depicts two glass clad buildings at the site's north end, which in concept we generally agree is the right direction, but reflective glazing on tall buildings near highways can produce unintended driving hazards. As an example, is the blinding glare created by the formerly called Trump Park in Stamford, sited at similar distance from the I-95 travel lanes as the proposed towers in this master plan are to the Merritt's travel lanes. The Conservancy currently has two talented architects on our board. So we request that you consider including the Conservancy and other community stakeholders as participants in developing and approving the design guidelines and make it a condition of approval. Thank you for your, the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Ben Hanpeter. I live at 262 East Avenue. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by saying that I uh, am in support of this of this development, uh, and there's a few there's a few main points that I want to touch on uh, in regards to my support. Uh, the first one is with regards to uh, housing prices and rents. Um, I think, as everybody knows, housing prices are going up in not just Norwalk but all over the Northeast region and really nationwide. And it's uh, typically my assessment that more housing has uh, beneficial effects for reducing upward pressure on, on rents. Uh, I do agree with one of the previous uh, commenters points that I'd like to see some socioeconomic analysis on, on this proposal to see uh, if there would be any elements of gentrification if you know long time residents would be priced out. I would like to think that would actually be the opposite way around, um, you know, that providing more uh, market rate apartments uh, reduces the demand for, for less expensive units elsewhere in the city, um, but it would be good to get that clarified uh, one way or the other. Um, the other point that I want to touch on is with regards to uh, connectivity and sustainability and density. Um, for Norwalk to meet sustainability goals, I think it's very important that we build dense walkable neighborhoods, especially adjacent to existing mass transit infrastructure. Um, the current Merritt 7 station to me seems like it's underutilized right now. Um, so a development of this size right next to the existing station uh, to me seems like a home run. It's pretty much the best bang for your buck you can get anywhere in Norwalk. Um, and then to add to that benefit, this is gonna be right next to the NVRT or NRVT, excuse me, uh, as has been discussed at length. 
um, which will allow for uh, car-free connectivity both north and south, you know, into Wilton and into Norwalk. Um, that said, I think as the development goes on through future phases two and three, um, you know, I'm excited to see what specific uh, changes are going to be made to the main avenue area and the Route 7 area to make it more pedestrian and uh, cyclist friendly. Um, I personally, I work at ASML. I live in East Norwalk um, and I ride my bike to work, but I do not go anywhere near Main Avenue or uh, Route 7 because it's really dangerous. I take West Rocks, um, which itself needs some improvements. Um, you know, related to that, there's all these businesses, Walmart, you know, LA Fitness, uh, numerous restaurants and other amenities that uh, would serve these future residents of the of the North Seven development, but right now the connectivity is frankly awful. Um, so I think before phases two and three can be built out, uh, that that has to be remedied. Um, you know, I know that most folks' criticism of this project relates to traffic, but I think that's a pretty weak argument against building housing. I think that means that we have to find ways to alleviate traffic. Uh, it's not necessarily true that more housing has to lead to more traffic. You just have to be thoughtful about how you um, how you implement. Uh, another note is that I'd prefer to see a lower parking minimum than 1.3 spaces per uh, spaces per unit, but I know that's pretty much written into the uh, to the zoning regulations. Um, I think that about wraps up my uh, my comments. Uh, conclusion: I, I support this development. Um, I'm excited to see it implemented. Uh, we just have to be thoughtful with respect to how we connect it into the surrounding communities and to making sure that existing residents don't get priced out of the area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arlene, if you're there, it's uh, on mute. It's at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, if anyone else is looking to speak in regards to this application, you could raise your hand now. It's at the bottom of your screen, the little raise your hand tool. Or if you're dialed in on a phone, you'd hit star nine. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Lazaro, and I also live in the Glen Rock condos on Oakwood Avenue. Um, you could do all the traffic studies you want, but I wonder if anyone has actually looked and walked up and down uh, Glover Avenue. It's one lane in each direction. It twists, it winds, um, it's uphill. Uh, I just can't see, I, you know, it's not, we live in Connecticut, people use cars. How would you even go food shopping or CVS unless you're really in good shape and don't mind walking uh, to, to stop and shop and carrying your bags back? Uh, people are going to use cars. This is the suburbs. It's not New York City. Um, and I was just tonight uh, coming from uh, Stanford. And it was fairly early, so it was before six, it was maybe before five o'clock. And the traffic at the end of the expressway turning right onto Gristmill Road backs up, you know, you have to wait through maybe three or four lights to, to get through that intersection. Um, as someone else mentioned, the, the traffic near Walmart, near that West Rocks, it, it, these are all accidents waiting to happen. Um, but even just Glover Avenue, I just can't conceive of adding more and more and more traffic to this little street. And what happens when it snows? And, you know, the, we've had we've had years where there this we haven't had bad snow years lately, but we have had and we will have again, I'm sure, uh, you know, where the snow is is packed up. And you know they built this esplanade with these pretty little trees and lights in the middle of the road on Glover by the curb. But <laughs> where's snow going to go when it when we have heavy snowstorms? 
And there's people, um, that there's cutouts and parking spaces in front of the curb buildings. And it's, it's not even enough because people get food delivered, people are dropping someone off. Uh, you, you know, I, I drive by there all the time. I live up the block. Um, I, I think I think the developers are putting their their head in the sand. Uh, it's a tiny little street. How can you keep adding all these units? Um, the other thing I would worry about with BLT, I think we know that in Stanford, um, they had a problem with one of the buildings down in the Harbor Point with a, a balcony falling off. So um, I guess I would maybe have some concerns about the quality of their building. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Diane Loricella, 304 Main Street, number 357. Um, I've long been an admirer of both BLT's initiatives around the area and Carl Keener. Uh, I, I remember when they had a tiny little office up on Old Route 7 in Wilton. And uh, my how things have changed. And I think, um, you know, I congratulate them on their initiatives for many years. But I ask on this particular project that BLT and the city asks BLT to go back to the drawing board. As submitted for tonight, I cannot support and I do not support this project because I believe that it is too intense, too dense, even though I am a proponent of TOD planning and have spoken out about it for our South Norwalk and East Norwalk train stations. But this particular project is so much grander and greater. I'm not sure that it, it fits with the intention of the POCD. The building, some of the buildings are too tall. And I asked the commissioners to literally go out with a balloon, a, a helium balloon attached to a string and lift up that balloon up to the point that would be the top of the 150 foot building. So you could see the scale. This actually worked pretty well when I and many well-intended uh, citizens went uh, and protested the, the alleged BJ's wholesale site on Main Avenue to see what the true scale was. It's just hard to imagine 150 feet, but I, I think that would be due diligence on the part of the commissioners. Um, Attorney Waters, you had a very complicated project laid out and, and you did so in a, in a, in a great organized way. Um, no doubt, you, you're, a, you're a master at this. On questions of affordable housing, I'm, I'm gonna try to make sure my comments are things that haven't been uh, already discussed by previous, as, as uh, Chairman Shulman has asked, and I will be uh, quick. On affordable housing, could could the applicant please be more specific? Is it 10%, at least 10% of each building that is um, going to be built? Is it each phase, 10% of each phase? Or is it greater than 10% of, of what we currently term as affordable housing? As someone who is challenged to afford market rate, let alone what we're terming as affordable housing in Norwalk, some of the previous speakers said that we would hate to see gentrification take place. Well, it is already here in every section of Norwalk. There are many people that are not going to be able to return and remain in Norwalk. What is your application doing? I don't think that that was mentioned and I will confess I haven't read every single document yet of this application. Sustainability goals. As you know, I am a great proponent of green infrastructure, green building design, and I am pleased that uh, these things are proposed um, in this, this project. But what was not mentioned is what is the effect, uh, what type of green infrastructure will this application in its uh, rollout of the drainage plans be utilized so that the Norwalk River, what is the impact to the Norwalk River and any of its 
um, streams and, and the like, mainly because as some of you know, I was the founding president back in the 90s of the Norwalk River Watershed Association. I am not speaking tonight on behalf of them at all, but it just goes to my years of interest in the impact that um, pervious surfaces have on not only our uh, wildlife and forests, trees, et cetera, but also rivers like the Norwalk River. So if, if that could be more specifically uh, laid out, that would be terrific. As far as parking spaces, um, I think it's well and good that finally our, our zoning commission as planning and zoning commission rules are looking at reducing the number of parking spaces per unit, especially in a TOD project, I would just suggest to this applicant that they offer bonuses for any renter that doesn't have a car. And quite frankly, do you have bike racks strewn throughout this project? I didn't read it or hear of it, but I think I, I know you're trying to make this more walkable, but is it also more bikeable? That would be of interest to me. Today, I just so happened to have to go to Wilton. So I was on the Gristmill Road flyover and I was stuck at the end of Gristmill Road at that T area. And then also again, because of a backup near the DMV of the, the light. Um, I do think that previous commenters are right on when they say that it seems that most of the tr major traffic studies were done during a pandemic. The staff should make sure that before, I, I think we should press the pause button here because before this commission can be informed enough to vote on this project, you need to have traffic, recent traffic studies like the ones done in, the tw in 2020. If that is the case already, I stand corrected, but I just got a sense that most of the major parts of traffic were done back when we had a pandemic and as others said, when other large buildings on that little street on Glover were not complete yet. Also, I want to point out to this commission is my understanding that OSTA, as pointed out by Attorney Waters, they mostly are concerned and check in on whether the traffic um, calculations are correct after the project is built, not before. Um, now again, I stand corrected if that is untrue, but. Uh, other work we did with the Merritt Parkway Conservancy over the years, we learned this and we were kind of shocked, but the truth is they look at it, they do meet with an applicant before a project, but they double check the calculations and the data after the project. So you, this applicant has to prove that they've done what they said they would do. Sometimes it's too late. So we just wanna make sure your traffic data is up to date I also ask just for clarification on the percentage of impervious surfaces. Now, again, uh, the applicant is, is saying they're going to be using green roof, which of course um, I know sometimes has been misinterpreted like at the mall. I do not think BLT will misinterpret it and the staff should not let them. And that is, we don't mean that there is a nice little uh, bar up on the, on the roof with some trees, palm trees on it. We're talking about succulents or, um, literally um, a roof uh, material that will absorb uh, 30 to 40% of runoff, especially during a time of climate change, uh, that we are experiencing intense extreme storms. So every bit will help. I also ask what West Cog and, and if we, there's a second opinion available from a more independent group like Western, the West Cog, Western Connecticut Council of Governments, since this is right on the border of Wilton, and also uh, so a group like the Regional Plan, Plan um, uh, RPA, the Regional Plan Group Association. They have wonderful people that look at projects like this and can give both the applicant and the commission some very neutral but very professional assistance on whether this is too dense, too tall, and too intense. Then lastly, I just wanted to say, um, that um, the urban heat island effect and pervious surfaces are a real thing. Um, it seems like this, this applicant is kind of looking at it, but I don't think there's enough information. And the inclusion of solar and um, green roofs and that sort of thing, I implore this commission to now really think of making sure that this is a policy 
And so that anyone that builds in our city, I'm glad that this applicant is rising to that uh, rule or that zone, but across the board, let's just make this part of, part of every application because um, it is the right thing to do for our city to be truly sustainable and have a lower carbon footprint. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello? Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, speak. I won't take very long. I just, uh, I, I find it somewhat amusing to uh, this committee that uh, the whole subject matter, since this entire area is an area where 60 years ago I grew up. It was mostly rural. It was all single family houses and uh, I understand progress. My old neighborhood has already been pretty much bulldozed off the face of the earth. So that said, you've already chased out the people. Um, the traffic studies that uh, have been mentioned before, that's, that's all fine. I won't repeat a lot of that. Um, anybody who wants to conduct a traffic study just simply has to go up there during rush hour and just see how quickly everybody goes. And adding another couple hundred uh, cars is not going to help matters at all. Um, in terms of significant open space, uh, it already was mostly open space and leaving a little tiny park uh, around a little creek that is mostly swamp is not going to really uh, contribute significantly to open space. Uh, I find that interesting. And um, other than that, it's just uh, building a haven of unaffordable apartments for mostly renters, which I think is seriously going to uh, create a transient uh, populace, and uh, that's not going to benefit the city of Norwalk in terms of uh, the infrastructure, the, the load on the infrastructure, and uh, not only just the traffic, the education, the city services, where sewage, garbage collection, uh, and everything else like that. Uh, I just, for those reasons alone, I, I, I stand in opposition to this uh, catastrophic project. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Still nothing. You might have to check your um, your audio settings. Can you hear me now? Here yes, we go. We yep. Can. Okay. I sent you a letter, and you may have read it. Uh, what I am concerned about is we seem to be building a third center for Norwalk, and we already have two centers. And I don't think we need a third center. This doesn't need to be this big. And while we all envisioned a village to, a to accompany the Super 7 railroad station, we did not envision building a third center. We all strongly support affordable housing and feel Norwalk has done a pretty good job on this issue over the years. And we support continuing and allowing for the Norwalk River Valley Trail, a change from eight stories to 15 stories is an enormous change, virtually doubling the height of the buildings. In both Wilton and Norwalk, the built environment on either side of the river from these enormous proposed 15 story buildings is historic and fragile, especially in the Norwalk Wilton silver mine area. And this development puts undue pressure on this area to further develop. We are looking at climate change that is already happening and, and North Seven being built in the river valley of the Norwalk River 
will remove more of the needed absorption of the land and replace it with asphalt. I can see it on your plan. Has a hundred year flood been anticipated? Is Norwalk planning for drainage beyond the hundred year flood, given that our area experienced rainfall approaching a 500 year event in the fall of 2021 with Hurricane Ida. The area in which this development is proposed already has a major traffic problem. I think lots of people have talked about that. The development, uh, uh, I, I, these proposed buildings are three stories higher than the Sono Corporate Center which is in a downtown area and is the highest building in Norwalk along with 901 Main Avenue. These proposed buildings are four stories higher than the extant Mar Merit 7 buildings numbers 401, 501, and 601. Uh, these new buildings are not in a downtown area but they are now further creating a downtown area. If you are changing the plan, why are you changing the review process? And lastly, the past short-sighted approach by Condot to designing the final connection to the Merritt Parkway has resulted in the massive and very expensive interchange to be built in 2025. That past short-sightedness included not retaining enough land. Are you absolutely sure they won't need the land that is being rezoned? Nor was the Super 7 land ever properly landscaped as promised. So thank you, I oppose this these changes as they stand. I live at, my name is Lee Grant, and I live at 99 Comstock Hill Avenue, Norwalk. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone else is looking to speak, you can use the raise your hand tool now or hit star nine if you're on a phone. Arlene, we could give one more shot, hopefully it works. If not, you could always submit written comments to myself or Steve. Looks like that's it for tonight, Lou. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, I'll turn it back then to uh, uh, David Waters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so if I'll allow me to rebut at this point, um, a couple of questions that uh, the first speaker uh, asked were, you know, are any tax breaks being given? The answer is no. Uh, there is absolutely no, uh, tax uh, benefits that have been given. This is purely market rate. Um, the only thing that we have done uh, is to seek uh, the uh, impetus to get the DOT and the state of Connecticut to use infrastructure funding to improve the roadways, which should have been improved 30 years ago uh, when uh, Route 7 was originally uh, created. Uh, but there is, there are no tax breaks that are given. We're not getting any credits, uh, any of that sort. The question about school funding was also raised, uh, and, and I think Dr. Poland had, had indicated that we we understand that there is an expense. Um, the amount of money that is being generated by this, these developments uh, will more than offset those expenses. Um, it'll be up to the city to make sure that they actually use the money for, the, for uh, educational uh, things. But, uh, but, but in fact, the properties are fiscally positive. 
question about the traffic studies and when they were done. The traffic studies were all done back in 2019 before COVID hit. Uh, the, the reports were done later, but all of the numbers, and it's already been addressed uh, uh, expressly in the reports as to what they are. Uh, and I think that Mark Bertucci specifically can talk to the fact that um, the, uh, the 2024 volumes are actually what is being calculated for purposes of phase one. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out, because it's come up a couple of places on drainage, is that we did submit a drainage uh, report. And in that drainage report, uh, we specifically, hang on just a second if I may. You'll find in the drainage report that the, in the existing conditions, that existed, there were 12.13 acres of impervious surface out of 16.35. In the proposed master plan, the impervious acres is 9.18. So three acres less, 25% less impervious surface will exist with the implementation of the master plan than exists currently based upon all of the development that had been there, parking lots, uh, industrial buildings, and what have you. So the drainage actually is going to be better uh, and the impervious surfaces will be less as a result of the implementation of the master plan. Um, Mr. Haynes of, of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, um, my apologies because I seem to have misled you. I actually am on the 715 PAC group myself. Um, I, I know that Commissioner Mushak is as well as is Mr. Hayes. Um, my point in showing the, uh, the one alternative was not to suggest that that's the one that we favor. In fact, we don't. We, we favor uh, the other alternative that he does as well. Uh, that being said, the reason that we showed this one is because it is the most impactful. And so if it was to be approved, that would be the one that, uh, that would have the greatest impact. And that's why we showed it that way. Um, again, as far as whether alternative 26 would meet the capacity requirements, when we get to the point where we need to get, uh, to get OSTA approval and DOT approval of this, we will have to demonstrate that that is in fact the case. Uh, as it stands now, the only thing that we know that we will be developing as phase one is the first three buildings, the Southern buildings. And we know that those are not uh, related to and not tied to the improvements to the Merrick Parkway and Route 7. Um, I also think that we may have uh, misled uh, Mr. Haynes as well, because he was talking about uh, the tallest buildings being glass clad buildings. In fact, the buildings haven't been designed yet. Uh, what we have shown is uh, purely a conceptual master plan. And I can understand when you look at the perspectives that have been submitted, that it looks like they are all glass clad buildings. In fact, they're just showing the bulk of the buildings, not any architectural features, certainly not showing uh, what the outside of the building actually looks like and the design guidelines that we have uh, worked with the city to uh, create actually do show, uh, you know, the types of materials that would be permitted and required uh, in order to develop each of these buildings, but the, it is not intended that these will be glass clad buildings. Um, Ms. Lazaru uh, was talking about traffic uh, the, and traffic backups. And again, we've submitted our traffic study. We stand by what those say. Uh, Ms. Laricella uh, claims again, too tall. Again, I point out the fact that what we, the, the height that we have put as the maximum height is what is already allowed in the zone. 
It's not that we're adding, it's, it's that already allowed there. Uh, the question about affordable housing, uh, yes, we are required to and will be meeting the 10% affordable housing requirement for each building, not each phase, but each building. That would be a requirement in any case. Uh, sustainability, what impact to the Norwalk River? Again, I point out that uh, not only are we increasing the uh, pervious surfaces, but also the drainage reports indicate and, and part of the requirements under the regulations that we have uh, also promulgated would require things like rain gardens and what have you in order to again um, offset any impact and in fact enhance what is going on. Uh, bike racks, we are required to uh, include bike racks and that's part of the uh, design standards, but it's also something that we have done and will continue to do uh, it is, in fact, in all of the curb buildings, uh, and, and it is a requirement in, in the standards that we have created here that we have uh, protected and sheltered back, uh, bike um, uh, storage areas. We agree that uh, on the percent impervious surfaces, uh, talking about roof materials, uh, in fact, we've used uh, vegetative roofs here in Stanford. Um, that's not to say that all of them will be of that uh, type. Some of them will be of the type where you have actual planter areas, not like a potted palm, but actual planted areas on the, uh, uh, on the, the amenity roof um, that uh, then become part of the uh, amenity, but also are part of the green roof. Uh, as far as West Cog is concerned, I know that this application was referred to West Cog, and they came back and said that there was no uh, municipal or there was no interlocal impact, and so therefore they made no comment. Um, let's see. Um, it's, Again, uh, Mr. Burgess uh, spoke about that the property, the area was mostly open space uh, and that uh, we were just leaving two acres of, uh, of an area that was right around the stream. In fact, the area that is this, where this development occurs uh, was highly developed. Uh, there has been commercial uses there. Southern Air was there uh, and repaired 747 engines. Uh, virtually the entire property until you get to the north end of it was uh, paved over. And in fact, the area around the brook was literally paved with parking up to the <clears throat> bank of the brook. So the concept that this was mostly open space is just not accurate. Uh, what will occur as a result of the uh, implementation of the development plan and the master plan is that uh, you'll have a great deal more. And in fact, that brook will now have um, the type of protection of the uplands that it does not have at this point. Um, Lee Grant's comments, a statement about building a third center for Norwalk that isn't needed, and I would, I would uh, object to that and state that, as I pointed out, this area of Norwalk is the economic engine of Norwalk. It has the Class A offices. It has the high quality uh, uh, office tenants. And if we don't support it and make it into uh, the neighborhood that it needs to be in order to attract those types of tenants and their employees, then you are not going to get what you're looking for at all. Um, the change from eight to 15 stories is enormous, except that, as, as was pointed out, uh, Merit is uh, 801 and 901 are already at 13 and 14 stories. So it hasn't changed and it is permitted in the zone as it is currently uh, proposed. Um, the, uh, she also raised the question about uh, Connecticut DOT not retaining enough land in case they need it in the future. Um, what I can tell you is that the north end of the development site was acquired from DOT. Uh, it was done with an act of the legislature and it was done 
uh, with a great deal of discussion as to the exact dimensions and parameters of what uh, was deemed to be excess land by DOT. It wasn't us that suddenly decided that we just were going to take their property. They conveyed it to us once they understood what they needed, and they did that on the basis of looking at not only what could be done as is being contemplated now uh, for a different end to uh, the expressway, but also what would happen if the expressway ever were extended up through Wilton and you needed to put in an exit and an interchange at that location. So the answer is they went into it with their eyes wide open. They knew what they did not need and they conveyed what they did not need to us, but retained the rest. And that's one of the reasons incidentally that the, uh, the project uh, delineation is kind of a, at the North end is kind of a pointy end because in fact, that's the way that DOT required it to be. I think that addresses all of the, uh, all of the comments that have been made, but if there's anything else that I can uh, respond to, I'd be happy to do so. Are there any further questions uh, at this point? Uh, David, I'm, uh, need to say that uh, we're not going to vote on this this evening. I would have been shocked if you had. <laughs> I probably would have been concerned if you had as well. But that's <laughs> I, I, I think there's some additional conversation needs to take place uh, between you and uh, our staff. Uh, and uh, frankly, we need a little time to chew on this as well. I, I completely understand, Mr. Chairman. As, you, as we've all acknowledged all, along the way, this is a big project. It's a significant project. We all need to make sure that it's done correctly and that everybody is protected. Right, and uh, so I want to alert you, and again, uh, anyone else who's uh, listening, uh, that this will be on our agenda for June 15th, uh, at which time uh, I uh, expect we'll be in a position to uh, uh, finalize um, uh, any uh, outstanding issues and uh, uh, take a vote on the project. Lou, are we closing the public hearing at this point, though? No, we're going to uh, hold open uh, the uh, public hearing. Um, but we have had, unless uh, Steve uh, suggests otherwise, we gave everyone who was here for the public hearing an opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm not sure that we need to extend that. Right. That's sort of what I was thinking. We've yeah. sort of exhausted the public piece of it. Let's put that to rest. And yeah, with the exception of Ms. Ehrenberg, um, right. for some reason, wasn't able to speak. Uh, Steve, is uh, that correct? Yeah, I, just one quick thing. There, there were several emails that came in this afternoon that I have not been able to forward to the commission yet, and I will get that done. Um, I mean, it's at your discretion whether you want to close the hearing or not be up for, for additional public comment. Um, I, obviously, I think you could keep that open and then, but you know, anyone who, who spoke tonight doesn't necessarily have that opportunity to uh, speak a second time. Right, and I, I, I also think that since we have a significant number of uh, outstanding emails in order to be fair uh, to um, uh, Attorney Waters, um, he ought to, should he feel uh, the need, uh, have the opportunity to respond to any uh, issues that have been raised in those emails that have uh, not, yet been, not yet been brought up. Mr. Chairman, if I may suggest, and, and I understand the, the desire to make sure that the public gets their, their ability to speak, mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that they have had their ability to speak. I understand that Ms. Ehrenberg hasn't had an opportunity to uh, make her comments. And so if she desires to do so in writing, that would be fine. And we could, uh, we could address that. And certainly uh, if there are other uh, comments that have come in, uh, I'll be happy to, upon uh, uh, being provided with them from your staff, I'm happy to then uh, file a, a response to them as well. Uh, but what I would suggest in order to be efficient about this is that uh, 
everybody that has had an opportunity to voice an opinion has had that opportunity. Uh, and so I would request that the hearing be closed for other than uh, Ms. Ehrenberg to have an ability to uh, uh, file a written statement and for me to be able to respond to whatever written statements uh, have been received. And we'll do that so that you then have all of those prior to your next meeting. That, that, that's fine with me. I think that uh, is what Commissioner Cantor was referring to in, uh, in his yeah, comments agree. as well. I uh, agree with that as well. I'd okay. like to make a suggestion, please. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Steve uh, Clappin, can you please just give your email address to uh, uh, whoever's listening in? I think there's still 47 people and I think what five people spoke. Uh, for uh, written comments. Uh, if, Steve, if you don't mind just repeating your email address to make it easy for uh, people to send in ri any written comments. And, and what is the date? What would be the cutoff uh, of that? Uh, Lou, can you clarify that, please? Well, our, our next meeting is uh, June 15th. Uh, <laughs> so that would, uh, that would be a hard cutoff date. Not that people couldn't go further, but it's likely that we're going to take action on June 15th. So Steve, could you mind repeating your email address to uh, the public? Oh, I don't think you can hear me. Uh, well, no, I, I can hear you. Oh, sorry. Sure, I was, uh, there's no chat function on this, otherwise I would have put it in the chat, but I could, it is on the city's webpage if you could navigate to the planning and sure. page. Sure, and, and I'm aware it's, of that. Uh, but I was just trying to make it easy for- uh, Yeah, no, I'm gonna read it off just in case people miss it, but it's um, S. Kleppen, which is my last name, K-L-E-P-P-I-N, at norwalkct.org. All right. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and one quick point of clarification, and maybe Attorney Waters would uh, comment as well. I think it, you know, it, whether you take action at your next meeting or not, I think you'd have to vote on the text amendment and the map amendment um, separately and then take action at a later date on the, the special permit application because I'm thinking that the technically the special permit isn't in effect or can't be acted on until it's on the books as part of the zoning text. I think that's probably the safer course of action and what Attorney Waters thinks about that. Uh, I, that would be fine with me. I think that you could, certainly the order of approvals would have to be that the map change would occur first, uh, although it could occur at the same time as the text amendment because they're not necessarily related to each other. Um, as far as the, the special permit is concerned, uh, I would suggest that you, yes, it, it could be done two ways, either that you wait to actually do the final approval uh, a, until after the effective date of the uh, text amendment uh, or, and, and the map change for that matter, or um, you just make the effective date such that it is after the uh, effective date of the, uh, the other two applications. All right. Well, Steve, we don't need to make uh, that decision tonight. Um, you can just draw up uh, the agenda for our meeting on the 15th uh, appropriately. Um, do we need to take formal action to close the hearing or can I simply close the hearing? I, I would, you know, I think you could probably do it by show of hands, but I would make somebody, the safest bet is to have someone make a motion to close the public hearing okay. pending written comment That's from whatever fine. date you establish. Right. Okay. The public. Sorry, go ahead, Darius. You do it. I move that we close the public hearing. I'll second. Okay, but with the understanding that um, uh, we will continue uh, to uh, accept uh, comment um, at uh, through 615. Uh, that acceptable, Darius? 
Okay. Absolutely. Uh, then, okay, thank you. By a show of hands, uh, all those in favor? Oh, sorry, sorry, Chair. Why 615? That's when we're meeting. It should be something like 614. Um, Otherwise, we're in the same problem as we are before without the email re being received by us. Someone certainly could um, uh, send us uh, something on the morning of the 15th. Um, do we want to do like three o'clock on the 15th? Um, everybody comfortable with that? Stephen, didn't you mention something? And I, I thought I read somewhere where you said that the emails had to come three hours before the hearing or something. Did I read that anywhere? Or? Yeah, it's posted on our agendas. Oh, okay. Well, then, then Darius's suggestion of three o'clock is perfect. Agreed. So uh, I will call then for uh, um, a show of hands. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. Is there anyone anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Good. Now, I, you know I promised we'd close at 9. It's 10 after 9. We do have two additional bits of business. It would be nice if we could act on those. Mr. Um, Chairman, I'm going to uh, recuse myself at this point, but thank you to you and to the commission and your staff. This has been a long time coming, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so, um, are you willing to indulge me for these, um, uh, uh, two items, which we have already discussed? We're not talking about the substance of the, uh, opt out. We're simply talking about the opt out. We're voting, um, just to opt out. Uh, we're not talking, I, at least I don't believe we're talking about the the um, what we're going to replace uh, that opt out with. I think that's a later discussion. Preliminary review, I think it says here. Yeah. Um, Steve, you want to just give a quick uh, intro? I will do that now, unless Brian wants to jump in and handle that. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, so these two are just to opt out for the accessory apartments and the, the parking. Um, this isn't. The public hearing that we're planning on, if you guys agree, having the public hearing at your next meeting, which is the 15th, um, to you know get public comment and then for you guys to vote on whether or not to opt out, at which point it'll be sent to the Common Council for them to hold their public hearing and whether to agree or disagree with you guys. Um, so again, we're not voting on any new regs, it's strictly just opting out. So the, the uh, first item is 2022-22, uh, Public Act number 21-29, opt out of accessory apartment with intent to revise regulations. Um, can I have a motion to- uh, I move. All right, Steve moves and- uh, I second. I'm sorry, Richard moves, Mike seconds. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 In, fav in favor. Okay. And any opposed? All right. Looks unanimous. Uh, and again, this is just for your to hold the public hearing at your next meeting. This isn't the vote to opt out. That that's that's correct. And and I'll say your draft guidelines, Brian, uh, looked really good for the ADUs. So, I, all thank right. Thank you. And those, well, I'm welcome. Any comments back on those? Um, you know, however you guys are thinking about it. Okay. Twenty twenty two dash twenty three. Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, Public Act 21-29, uh, opt out of parking requirements. Again, we're, we're voting um, uh, to um, uh, hold it, basically hold a hearing on opting out. Uh, can I have a motion to that effect? No. Okay, Tammy moves. Is there a second? Um, quick, quick question, quick, quick Pardon? question. What, Okay. Well, uh, well, just, just a moment before the question, uh, Brian second. Now, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is parking requirements. Is it parking maximums? Yeah. The state um, 
regulation puts in two maximums. Uh, it's one space per one bedroom or studio unit and mm -hmm. two spaces per two bedroom or more than two bedroom unit. Um, right, right now, our parking requirement is, is 1.3 spaces per unit. And then we give you a reduction down to one space per unit, regardless of bedroom size, if you provide 10% affordable and pay uh, uh, affordable housing fee. But that is not what we're that is not what we're voting on. We're simply voting on holding a public hearing to opt out of the state parking requirement. But isn't that. that excuse me, Lou, as it pertains to ADUs? We no, no, that's that's for general. all developments. Yeah, that's right. for like multifamily developments. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. So, and, Okay, again, uh, unanimous. Um, yeah, yeah, throwing my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, approval of minutes, May 18th. I'll make a motion. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Tammy. Uh, second. May, yeah, May, May. Was May 18th our last meeting? If, if it was Tammy, um, I, I, I didn't get a chance to read them, so I'm going to stay. And, and well, beyond that, Tammy wasn't at the meeting. I don't know if she can make the motion. Oh, you're right. Yeah, that's a good. So, point. could I ask someone else to make the motion? So, move. make the motion. All right. Let's say Richard beat you, Brian. So, okay. you're second. <laughs> you're second. Uh, all those in favor, raise their hands or show of hands. Um, we have uh, one abstention. I, I abstain. Two, two abstentions. Two. I'm sorry. Uh, who's the second? Tammy and JJ. Oh, okay. My apologies. Uh, uh, comments of the director. Steve, you have anything more? J two very quick things. Um, just when for the public hearing on the ADU opt out, I think it would be a good idea for Brian to walk through the proposed changes, so it's not just we're opting out because we're oblivious or don't care that we actually have a plan and here's why we're opting out. Um, and June 28th, I'll send an email out, but that will be the date for the uh, special meeting on the Weed, Weed Street, Weed Ave. Um, the school. school. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, so Sharon, could I just ask quickly uh, of Brian, um, you had indicated that you would welcome feedback on the, on the regulations that you wrote. Uh, how, how do we accomplish that? With just with an email? No, Copy fine. everybody or, or how, how does that work? Um, probably best just to send to me that way. It's not technically okay. a meeting. Okay. Uh, any, uh, any comments by uh, any of the commissioners? All right, if not, we'll move to uh, adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Okay, Hector moves, we adjourn. Tammy, you okay. seconded. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Well, thank you all for your patience. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a long night. Um, we'll see you on uh, June 15th. Good night. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night, Good night. 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 Good night.